The Town of Plainville Established in 1721 at the Geographical Center of Connecticut. Good evening, everybody. How are you tonight? Thank you so much for coming out to this forum regarding um, some work that's been ongoing in the town of Plainville regarding water quality issues. My name is Kathy Puglisi. I'm the chairperson of the Plainville Town Council. I'm going to do a few opening remarks and then our town manager Robert Lee will be moderating the event tonight so I think it's going to be informative. I learned a lot through this process and I'm sure tonight you're going to learn some things that you may not have been aware of. But before I begin I'd like to introduce a few of my fellow council members. Deb Tompkins is in the front row here. Rosemary Moranti is in the second row and Danny Carrier is in the fourth row. So these are um, these are your elected officials on the town council. They have um, been informed of these results and they're here to listen to the public and to understand what some of your concerns are. As we know, um, water is a resource that is invaluable to every town and every community. It's important for a number of things. We use it for recreation. We use it for cooking. We use it for bathing. We use it for public safety. Our fire department needs to have a reliable source of water in the event that a fire should occur. So as you can understand, our water and our water supply is extraordinarily important, and we want to make sure that we keep everything in the best possible function. Tonight what I'm going to do is you're going to meet the um, individuals who have been working on um, some questions and concerns that have arisen recently. Over the past several months, there's been a group of people, I've been involved with it, Councilwoman Moranti has been involved with this committee, along with a number of people from our state agencies and our town resources. So we've been meeting over several months. There was um, some in-depth study done. There were samples taken, and tonight you're going to learn about that, and you're gonna learn about the, what the results of that were. At the end of the evening, when everybody has finished with their presentation, we welcome questions from the audience. So if you could please hold your questions until the end of the presentation, we'd be very happy to hear from you. This is how we can communicate back and forth and understand the concerns of our community. And you can hear back from the experts that really know about what's happening with our water system and how it's going to affect our community going forward. So once again, Thank you so very much for coming tonight. And with that, I'd like to introduce Robert Lee, our town manager. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to welcome everyone to our forum this evening. This process began several months ago uh, as a result of you know, my, my uh, 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 view on social media that there was you know, some issues that come up and, and that seems to be the way that people uh, express themselves nowadays uh, and a lot more easier to communicate. But shortly after that, I know that Dr. Pettit also monitors social media as well and he called me and said, hey, let's, you know, let's, let's collaborate together and, and see if we, if, if we can address this issue and, and make people feel you know, comfortable about you know, the private water company that supplies water in Plainville, and I think the, the way you get there is to understand how our system works, how the system works, who's responsible for the system, who's responsible for overseeing the system. Uh, we had some meetings uh, uh, of staff and some people from the state and uh, did some extensive testing, and, uh, and, and what we'd like to do is, is, is talk about the results of those tests this evening, and more importantly, um, to you know, answer any questions that people might have after the presentation is over. We have brought in a lot of uh, uh, experts here this evening, uh, people who are responsible for overseeing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the system, uh, not only in Plainville, but in the state of Connecticut. Uh, so I'd like to at least, at least uh, introduce a few people who are here this evening uh, and before we get started. So Dr. Pettit is here. Uh, Plainville is part of a regional health district, the Plainville Southington Health District, and Shane Lockwood is our health director. For, the 
From the uh, Public Utilities Regulatory Agency, we have Frank Argiri, who's here this evening, who will be speaking. He also has a couple of staff people that uh, he will be introducing at that time as well. For the uh, Department of Public Health, who really looks at the, you know, the quality issues, we have Lori Matthew, who is here tonight, who's in charge of uh, the water. The Water Division, we have Tom Chira, Brian Toll, Vicki Carrier, Mike Hage, and Austin Mc McMahon. Uh, from Valley Water Company, we have three members of the board, Don Vaughn, Nick Lachance, and Bill Galski. Don Vaughn also happens to be the president of the uh, Valley Waters uh, Company. And we have uh, Tom Hansen, who's a consultant for, uh, for Valley Water, and I think they'll, they'll be uh, presenting as well. Now, we do have uh, an agenda. If you haven't received an agenda, just raise your hand, and my assistant, Scott, will, will, will hand those out. We do, we do have the, uh, uh, a spreadsheet of all the test results. I would like to point out that the test results, are, you know, you'll see for each category, you'll see two two numbers side by side. The top number is the testing that was done by the Department of Health, and the red number, which is below it, is the, is the Valley Water did some simultaneous testing, and, and so those numbers, we, we just figured we'd put them together, and, and, and I think by and large what those numbers show is that, you know, the test results are pretty similar, or very similar, so, you know, for those who say, you know, who may, you know, uh, speculate about the validity of, of the testing that's done by Valley Water just because they're doing the testing. Uh, you know what, what, what we've seen from these tests is that they're you know, you know they're, they're very similar and they're done by independent testing labs to begin with. So, uh, so without further ado, I think we'll start with Frank uh, or Jerry from the Public Utilities Regulatory Agency, and he'll explain the role uh, that they have overseeing uh, public water uh, supplies as well as private water companies. So, Frank. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Algeri. I'm with the uh, Connecticut Public Utilities Regulatory Authority. I'd first like to thank Robert Lee and the town of Plainville for the opportunity to speak with all of you tonight. Uh, I was asked to provide a description of my agency's responsibilities. Uh, I'll try to keep this brief. I'm sure you want to move on to the matter at hand. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, or also known as PURA, was formerly known as the Department of Public Utility Control. Our agency is now part of the energy branch within the state's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. PURA's primary responsibility is regulating the rates and services of Connecticut's investor-owned utility companies such as Valley Water, Eversource, Connecticut Natural Gas. Uh, for, so for those agencies, excuse me, for those industries who regulate, our goal is to balance the public's right to a safe, adequate, and reliable utility service at reasonable rates with the provider's right to a reasonable return of its, of its investment. So in addition to this great regulation responsibility, we also maintain a consumer affairs unit. Uh, the consumer affairs unit is where you would go if you need help, if you have a question or complaint complaint about billing, complaint about service. Uh, we can also help you or assist you if you've received a shutoff notice and you need help negotiating a payment arrangement. Generally, any type of question that you have with the quality of service or billing from your uh, utility company, that's why you would call a consumer affairs unit. We, we only ask that you do one thing first, and that's call the utility company first. Give them the opportunity to help you out. Uh, you might not like their answer, you can call us, but you really should give the company the first, the first attempt at helping your problem out. And if they can't satisfy you, by all means, call us. Um, we're available, available by telephone, email, US mail. We have a website where you can do an online complaint form. If you're in New Britain, you can stop in and we'll take your complaint in person. Uh, I'll provide our contact information at the end of this meeting. Uh, I intend to stay along with my staff, uh, Mary Ellen Zhang and Maria Zoll. We're going to stay through to the end of this uh, public information session. So feel free to come up, introduce yourself if you have questions, whether it's Valley Water or any of the other regulated utilities in Connecticut. We'll stay here and we'll answer your questions for you. Thank you.
Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Lori Matthew and ask her to come forward. She's from the Department of Public Health, and she will get into the uh, water test results and what it means. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Well, good evening. How is everyone? We're good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, my name, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to the town of Plainville and to Robert Lee. Um, we represent the State Department of Public Health. Um, Robert introduced a number of my staff here. Uh, my name is Lori Matthew. I am the section chief of the drinking water section within the State Department of Public Health. Uh, we are responsible uh, for all public water systems statewide. So can I walk and be heard at the same time over here or no? Because I need have, to move slides. We do have a, a microphone that uh, uh, you can carry with you. That I can carry? No. Scott, we'll get it for you. Okay. Well, thank you. Is it on? Yeah. It's on. Okay. Thank you. So I want to introduce my staff, and I know Robert did that briefly, um, but Tom Chira, Tom, if you could stand up. Tom's going to be presenting on the details in a moment after I, I get done. Austin McMahon, um, he's with us, and Vicki Carrier, Michael Hage. And those are our, under my group, uh, we have about 45 engineers and environmental analysts that oversee all of the public water systems statewide. And uh, there are eight or ten regulated, rate-regulated public water systems in the state of eight or ten. But there are over 2,550 public water systems that, that the health department regulates for water quality, water quantity issues. There's a, so there's a lot of, of information coming in and a lot of oversight that my agency oversees for all of the state's public water systems. I also want to introduce Brian Toll, who's going to speak at the end. And Brian is um, a very seasoned, very experienced epidemiologist within the health department. And um, he is excellent at explaining the health effects uh, for what has been found within the water and uh, will be at the end of our presentation. So, um, hmm. let me go back. So you, you would think in a small state that we have a few systems and just a few sources. You know, we're a very, very small state, but we're not set up that way. And you might think, well, why is that? Well, in a state like ours, um, every village back 200 years ago had their own little system, and that's how every town has grown up. And your town of Plainville is not unlike other towns within the state where you have your own sources of supply and you serve your area uh, with the sources of supply. And you might be connected to other water systems that surround you, and Plainville um, and, and Valley Water is connected in a number of areas to other, source, to other systems. But you have your own town, and you have your own, you have your own service area, and you serve, Valley Water serves about 16,000 people within your municipalities. And that's not unlike other towns in the state of Connecticut. Not unlike. So we have quite a few public water systems, and a public water system is also a Dunkin' Donuts with their own well. Like in my town, I live in Coventry, and we have 28 public water systems. You might say, why is that? Well, the church with a well, the Dunkin' Donuts with a well, the CVS with a well, the, <laughs> the schools with a well, the firehouse, every one of those is a regulated public water system that has to take samples, is responsible for their water quality, their water quantity, and provides that information electronically into our database system. My engineers inspect those systems every three or five years. They also oversee the water quantity and the water quality. And if there's any change anywhere, quality, quantity, that's our responsibility to react and work with the water system to make sure that any and all it items are addressed. And that includes complaints and working with the water company and the people that would call and complain and have concerns, lack of water, lack of water pressure, poor water quality, you know, the, the water tastes different today. We get a lot of the water looks brown, um, has a different color. We get involved with many, many of those types of um, calls. And we, we answer and respond to about 40 to 60 uh, complaints um, a year, usually. So there's a lot of work to do. Uh, we work uh, in two areas. 
the state of Connecticut and the regulation of public water systems has been around for about 100 years. Uh, early 1900s, they started building treatment plants, they started developing water systems for, not only for consumption, but you, you mentioned uh, fire protection as well. It's a big part of this. And having the water in the pipes for fire protection is very, very important. And so we've been, on the state side, have a whole host of state requirements that are quality and quantity, but also in the 70s, all, along comes EPA and starts the Safe Drinking Water Act and has been amended and updated continuously for about 40 years. So we're responsible for two things, state law, federal law. We take the federal law and put it into state rules and regulations and pass those and enforce all of that. So it's not only quality that we oversee, we also oversee quantity as well. So we're quite busy with those 2,550 systems that we're inspecting, we're overseeing, we're answering questions, we work and oversee the water companies. We are regulators of the water companies statewide. So the, and the, the community systems serve just about 3 million people within the state. The remainder of the population, about five or 600,000 people, are served by private wells. Now, the sampling within your town, or I think Robert called me or emailed me back in December, it was before Christmas, and he said, shared information that he had been seeing information on Facebook and that he had been seeing quite a bit of concern on behalf of the people that were consuming water. There were lots of complaints. And he wanted to share that with me, and we uh, spent some time talking about what that meant. Um, and then we talked about what could, what could be done. Like, what, what could be done? What could we do? And we talked about different options. And we said, well, why don't we get a meeting together? Why don't we sit down with the water company and go through what we could do and develop a plan working together? Because there were, there were so many complaints that were getting received and there were so many comments out there that we wanted to make sure that we could uh, under, fully understand what was happening. We worked with Shane Lockwood. And we brought um, everyone to the table um, and we had a first meeting and we decided to develop a plan, a, a sampling plan. Um, and we had a lot of great thoughts on the table, such as we're going to take samples we offered uh, the assistance of my engineers uh, to take the samples themselves, who are fully trained in taking samples. But uh, not only doing that, but bringing those samples uh, for free, bring them to the state lab. We have a state lab facility in Rocky Hill, and we wanted to do that, and we offered that assistance. Um, also, I think it was for Dr. Pettit who said, well, why don't we do dual sampling at the same time? You know, why don't we make sure that when we're sampling, that also Shane's out there sampling, and also the water company's pulling samples. So we, we're, and Tom will get into more of the details on all of what we did and how we did it, and the spreadsheets that you have, it, you know, show the details of all of those results. But we wanted to be comprehensive. So if we're gonna spend the time, and we spent a, a, a lot of time thinking this through with the town. Where's Scott? Where is Scott? Scott in the back. It's a tremendous resource in your town thinking through what to do next, where to go, where to sample, where are the locations, let's spread it out, let's not go to just where a few people uh, had the complaints, but where every, look where everybody had complaints. Where are they within your town, within the system? Map it out and let's be smart about where to pull the samples from. So you'll see a map and Tom will get into the details of the locations um, that we pulled samples from. And uh, we spent a lot of time doing that and he'll go through the details. But it was definitely well, a very well thought out plan based upon what we had seen from, from you and uh, from the complaints that were being received. So the representative samples are throughout not only um, municipal and town buildings, but also your own homes, your own apartments. Um, so in uh, one time, one chance, because I told Tom I wanted to go out myself spend a little bit of time in, in the sampling process. So I did that with, with Tom and, and Austin, and I, I got a chance to meet Heidi. Is Heidi here? No. Um, but I talked to Heidi a little bit, um, and, and uh, you know, she gave me some insight, and she said that, you know, I, I want to be able to drink the water. Why can't I drink the water? There's just the, it's, this doesn't, it's not appealing to me. So we had a conversation about that. And we told her what we were doing and how we we're going to do it, and that we're going to get back and we're going to have this forum, and then we could talk it out. So here's a map, and I think 
Um, we don't, we're not handing this out, but we have big copies of the map, Scott? We do, we're going to post it online. Okay. So, so we, here's the map, and we, we identified where we were going and where we were sampling from, and again, based upon the complaints, and we didn't focus in on, on one area or another. And as a matter of fact, when we were pulling this, inf this presentation together two days ago, uh, my commissioner came to me and said, Lori, did you spread out the sampling? Did you talk to local health? Did you work? I said, yes, yes, let me explain to you what we did. Because she had exactly, I think where some of you are probably thinking, well, maybe you just focused over here and over here, over here. We spread out the samples. We were pretty smart about where we went and why we did what we did. And, and, and what Tom is going to go through and then what, what Brian will explain is what did we sample for? What are the parameters? And why did we pick those parameters? Uh, you know, what was, what was found and what does that mean? Um, as far as health. Um, so there was a lot of work done, a lot of thought process that went into the locations in your town. So there were, there were 32 location samples uh, sampled, and there were two rounds. Um, and Valley Water, as we mentioned, had their staff, and they conducted their own sampling on the same dates. So when we were, my engineers were out sampling, when. Uh, Shane was out sampling, your local health director was out sampling. Uh, Valley Water was also there sampling at the same time. So the information that's on your spreadsheet shows the results of those samples. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Tom and get into the details. Again, Tom Chira, he's a PE. Uh, he's been with us for about 18 years, 19 years, that's close. And um, he's in charge of our a field unit that also oversees all the field inspections, all system inspections, as well as water quality uh, oversight. And um, so here's Tom Chira. Thanks, Tom. I think we use uh, this one. Unlike Lori, I like to stand behind the podium, so I'm going to stand here. Um, so Lori had talked about how uh, we had developed the uh, sampling plan, and you know one of the one of the important things that we did was we didn't want to just sample from locations that had submitted the uh, water quality complaint. So we wanted to get a mix of, of uh, homeowners who, who filed formal complaints uh, to the town and those that didn't, just so we can kind of compare the results and see if there's anything different between those who uh, formally filed a complaint and, uh, and those uh, uh, who, uh, who didn't. As Lori mentioned, there's a total of 32 locations. Uh, that we sampled uh, Shane and his staff on uh, April 6th. They went out and they sampled uh, a mix of uh, 18 uh, commercial and uh, municipal locations uh, throughout town. And then a week later on April 12th, uh, Austin, uh, myself, and uh, Scott from Town Plainville, uh, we went out and we sampled uh, 14 uh, residential locations. And as Lori had indicated, Valley Water uh, had their operators present on both dates and they uh, shadowed us and collected their own uh, their own samples. Brian, can you go down? So I just want to give a very quick overview of how we collected the samples. Uh, we didn't just go out there and, and open a tap. Uh, we do have a uh, standard operating procedure uh, that the uh, state lab in Rocky Hill uh, had given us for how to actually collect the samples so that they're done consistently and that they're done uh, the right way. Uh, for the residential sampling, uh, those were primarily collected uh, from outdoor uh, spigots. And, and uh, for the samples that we collected, that, that Austin collected uh, and myself, uh, we ran the water from the spigot for uh, at least four minutes. And uh, we actually timed that to make sure uh, that that water was run for at least four minutes. And during the sampling, we actually went to one uh, sample location where the homeowner was home and he actually had a very good question for us. He said, why are you letting the water run? Why not just sample the water right away? Don't you want to sample the water that's in my house? And the idea is we're trying, the reason why we run the water for four minutes is because you want to bring water that's in the distribution system out in the street. This is the water that Valley Water is providing to its customers. That's the water that we're trying to sample. Uh, to see what the water quality is of the water that's actually being delivered to the customers. Uh, sometimes, you know, when the water gets inside the home, it's hard to say if that water is being altered in any way, if you have a hot water heater that hasn't been serviced for 20 years. So the idea is you're collecting water from the street, you're getting a, a representation of the water that's being supplied uh, to your home. And as Lori mentioned, 
Uh, all 32 of these samples were then delivered uh, to the state uh, public health laboratory uh, in Rocky Hill for analysis. Just for visual purposes, we just want to show everyone what, uh, what a typical sampling uh, looks like. I think you want to just, and then there's some sample bottles up in the front there. I asked my staff to uh, just to bring uh, so people can see what they look like. It's basically a half gallon uh, container and what is that, 250? Yeah, 500. 500. Half gallon. So that's, uh, and basically what we do is we open up the, uh, the spigot, we let the water run for four minutes as I had mentioned, and then we literally just fill the uh, sample bottles. So I just want to talk about uh, some of the, the, uh, the parameters that we tested for. So the, the primary chemicals that we, that we sample for are, are what's called uh, sanitary chemicals. Um, Vicki had mentioned this morning, sometimes they call them pot uh, a standard potability test. And what sanitary chemicals are is they are a general, a broad suite of parameters that gives you a general idea as to the potability and to the uh, aesthetic quality of drinking water. And when we get complaints and we go out and we investigate across the whole state, this is typically what we would sample for during our investigation, uh, these uh, sanitary chemicals. And just to give, give you an idea of what they uh, consist of, it's uh, the color, odor, uh, turbidity, which is the uh, cloudiness of the water. Uh, pH, ammonia, which uh, tells you if there's any kind of uh, septic or uh, sewage intrusion. Uh, nitrate, nitrite, which can be uh, attributed to, uh, to the same thing and also to a uh, high uh, use of fertilizers. Uh, alkalinity, hardness, which we're going to talk about in a couple minutes. Uh, chloride, sodium, and uh, two naturally occurring minerals in the iron and manganese. And we also felt that the nature of the complaints that we saw from the town uh, were covered by, by the sanitary chemicals. So we felt very uh, co uh, comfortable that if we sample for sanitary chemicals, it would give us a uh, very good uh, representation and, and idea of the general water quality uh, throughout the uh, distribution system. Uh, the other uh, parameter that was tested for was sulfate. And uh, if you have elevated sulfate in your drinking water, that could cause the water to have a very bitter taste. So it was good to, uh, to sample for that. Uh, also at each sampling location, we also measured uh, what's called a free chlorine residual. Uh, Valley Water uh, does chlorinate their, uh, their water. And when they present after uh, I do, they can talk about that in more detail. But we wanted to see at each of these 32 sampling locations, uh, did they have a, a chlorine residual uh, present throughout their system. In general, the further out you go in, in, in a water distribution system, especially at dead end water mains, uh, it's fairly typical to find very low or non existent chlorine residuals. But if you're chlorinating your sources of supply and you're finding a lot of uh, non detections of chlorine residuals throughout your system, that could be, an, uh, that could be a uh, indication that the water is stagnant and, and not moving through the system and that could also cause uh, taste and odor complaints. Okay, so moving on to the test results and I hope everyone has a copy of the spreadsheet. Uh, if they don't, you can see Scott, or raise your hand and Scott will uh, hand it out. Uh, basically, what we did, and I just, I just included a, a, a screenshot of it. I know it's hard to see, but I just wanted to, to make reference to it. But please uh, follow along on the uh, spreadsheet here. It's front and back. Uh, the front there, uh, that's, that has the date of uh, uh, April 6, 2017. Those were the samples that were collected by the uh, local health department. And then on the other side are the samples that the uh, State Department of Public Health uh, collected. Now, if you notice on the uh, spreadsheet, there are three columns that are highlighted in yellow, and those are the three areas that we're going to, uh, to uh, discuss here. Um, but as was mentioned in the beginning uh, of the uh, forum here, we also included uh, Valley's water samples um, at the same time just for comparison purposes. And as Robert had mentioned earlier, uh, as you can see, for the most part, they're pretty much uh, very similar to the results that, that we collected. 
Uh, as I get into my presentation, I'll keep referring to you know, our samples or 32 samples. I'm only going to be talking about the samples that we collected uh, uh, through the, uh, the State Health Department and Shane through uh, Local Health. I'm only putting Valley's water results there just for reference. Uh, when they come up here and speak, uh, they could uh, talk about those more if they want to. And then at the top, you'll see all of the, uh, the constituents that were sampled for. And in parentheses underneath, uh, you'll see uh, uh, various levels. And I just wanted to go over what some of the uh, levels are. So first and foremost, and, and, and they're all footnoted uh, at the bottom. Uh, first and foremost, what we have are what's called maximum contaminant uh, levels. So these are health-based federal and or state standards which are enforceable. Uh, there's also called, uh, th th there are other ones that are called secondary maximum contaminant uh, levels. These are non-enforceable. These are primarily uh, aesthetic uh, type standards. Uh, we also have uh, state standards for uh, pH, color, turbidity, and odor. And before I get into the three highlighted areas, uh, what I want to point out on all the results, all of the 32 results that we collected jointly with, uh, with local health, uh, all of the results were below uh, the established maximum contaminant level, secondary maximum contaminant levels, and our state standards for physical parameters. So for what we sampled for, the water was in compliance with state and federal regulations. But I do want to move on to the three columns that are in yellow because uh, we want to talk about those. Uh, Brian, can you uh, go down to the sodium slide? Next one. So I'm going to skip uh, harness just for a second and just talk about sodium. Uh, you'll see on the uh, sample results spreadsheet here that the uh, sodium results uh, that we collected. Uh, what we have is, is what's called a notification level and this is a regulatory uh, requirement that the water that's leaving the, uh, the sources, what we call the point of entry going into the distribution system, if the, if the sodium level is above 28, by regulation the water system has to notify their customers on an annual basis for as long as those samples exceed that notification level of 28 milligrams per liter. Uh, Valley Water did comply with this requirement uh, in their 2016 uh, Consumer Confidence Report. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have made that notification this year or in the process of making that notification for, for calendar year 2017, but you can talk about it when, when you get up and talk. And then Brian's going to mention something briefly later uh, on, uh, on sodium. Uh, but I just wanted to just to briefly include this slide and mention it only because if you're looking at this, you will see that the sample results were above 28. And I just wanted to explain what that means. I mentioned earlier that, we, that when we pulled the samples, uh, we, filled the, we let the spigot run for four minutes. We fill both of the sample bottles up. And then at the end, we collect what's called a, a free chlorine residual. Uh, eight of the 32 sampling locations uh, did not have a detectable free chlorine residual, and the ninth location uh, had a barely detectable chlorine residual of 0 0.02. Now, the sampling that I was involved in, uh, there were two locations that one of the two residential locations. One uh, was basically had a uh, non. Uh, detection. Uh, there was no chlorine residual in that sample that we collected and another location basically had a trace. Both of those locations were at dead ends. Um, so that's, uh, that's why we, you know, I just wanted to point that out that, um, and then Shane, I don't know later if you want to talk about the, uh, when, when, uh, when Shane and his staff did the sampling, uh, you had quite a bit of more throughout the center of town that, uh, that didn't have any uh, chlorine residuals. Uh, based on the other residuals that, that we saw throughout the system, uh, they are fairly typical of what you would find in a water distribution system the size of uh, Valley Water. So there, there did not appear to be uh, anything unusual uh, about those. And I just want to point out that there is no regulatory requirement for Valley Water to maintain or have a chlorine residual throughout their system.
So moving on to, to hardness, which is, which is really, I think, the kind of take home message for, for what we saw through these sample results. So just very briefly, hardness is, uh, is primarily attributed to naturally occurring calcium and uh, magnesium minerals. Uh, I'm not gonna go over all of the uh, ranges there, but the take home message is, is that a hardness greater than 180 is, is what would be classified as, as very hard. Uh, water and all 32 sample results that we collected uh, all of those samples uh, had a hardness uh, that was above 180 uh, the lowest result was 190 and the highest was 322 so just on based on these 32 samples uh, we could say that this water uh, would be classified uh, as very hard now I just want to point out too it's not in the slide but hardness is not unique just to the town of Plainville uh, hardness can be found uh, everywhere across the state, across the country. I think there was some study I was looking at this morning that said, uh, you know, 80% of, of, of sources in this country uh, have some form of hardness in it. So I just wanted to point that out, that it's not just unique to uh, Plainville. Uh, but here in Plainville, based on the 32 samples that we collected, the water would be classified as being very hard. And before I turn it over to Brian to talk about the uh, health effects, I uh, just wanted to uh, talk very briefly about some of the uh, aesthetic effects of uh, a very hard water. And, you know, based on the complaints that we saw, you know, there, there is a very strong correlation. So hard water uh, produces uh, scale formation inside uh, piping and fixtures. Uh, it may explain some of the complaints that we saw that where people actually had white gunk or particulates that were in their faucet aerators. Uh, hot water increases scale formation of hard water. So that's why some of your hot water appliances tend to wear out first. Uh, very hard water can affect appliances such as dishwashers, uh, laundry machines, coffee makers, uh, and can cause those appliances to, uh, to prematurely uh, wear out. Uh, you may also find white residue uh, inside your appliances and on surfaces such as uh, shower walls. Uh, dishes and uh, glassware. Uh, water that's very hard, uh, it's very difficult to, to create a soap lather, so it may be very difficult to, 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 to uh, you know, wash your hair. Sometimes people complain that you could have a film on your skin after. And in some cases, it may cause a uh, metallic taste uh, and or odor, so that could lead to some of the taste and odor uh, complaints uh, that were received. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian, who's uh, going to talk about uh, health effects. So the logical question is, that what does this mean in terms of, of health? Uh, you have uh, elevated levels of hardness and elevated levels of sodium. Um, and the, base, the bottom line answer for both at these levels is we would not expect to see any health effects. Um, so I'll talk about sodium first. Probably people are more familiar with sodium. Uh, we all get sodium in our diet. Um, we've all been told to decrease our sodium, uh, that it might uh, increase blood pressure. Um, but at these types of levels, that is um, not really a concern. <clears throat> the level of 28 that is in uh, the regulations, the statutes for the state of Connecticut, is actually sort of an historic number that probably will go away sometime. EPA used to have a notification number of 20. They have vacated that number, and EPA does not have a number for sodium. Um, I'm not sure why Connecticut's number was 28 versus 20. That goes back into ancient history. Uh, but EPA, reviewing the science over the past 10 years, has concluded that sodium in water at, at levels that are normally found are not an issue for high blood pressure or cardiovascular disease until maybe you got very, very high, up into the hundreds and, and maybe even higher than that. We all take in probably 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams of sodium every day in a, in a typical diet, and that would not include a bag of pretzels. Um, so something like 28 uh, milligrams per liter, that's almost the same. So that if you drank a liter of water a day, you'd be getting 28 milligrams most people get 1,000 to 1,500. Uh, for those people on salt-restricted diets, and there are fewer of those, 
uh, and maybe Dr. Pettit can comment on this, but the, the consensus in terms of people, even with severe heart disease or blood pressure, there's less and less focus on, on reducing salt to, to very low levels. In fact, it may be that somewhere around 500 milligrams a day is a bare minimum for most people. Below that, you're getting too little sodium. So um, we recently, for private wells, established a guidance level of 100 parts per million. That's out of an abundance of caution, and what all that says is that if you're above 100, you should let your doctor know. And you and your doctor should have a discussion, depending on your uh, state of health, whether or not 100 parts per million or 100 milligrams a day or 200 milligrams a day if you were drinking two liters of water a day, uh, is that something you should be concerned about? And mo for most people, that's not the case. So even though the levels are higher than this level of 28, that level is an old number <coughs> and probably will be vacated in, in the near future. And they're all below the level of 100, and the level of 100 is probably overly protective to begin with. So that's sodium. Hardness um, is actually a little bit easier. Uh, and I didn't, you know, to be honest with you, I didn't know a lot about hardness before this situation because we've never been asked because basically it's considered benign in most situations. And if you go to the EPA website or the CDC website or any of those places, there's generally not a discussion about health effects of hardness or this is a simple statement that there are no health effects for hardness. Um, and so the one place I found, there is a World Health Organization document from 2008 that's fairly extensive. Um, and they basically, the World Health Organization has concluded that there are no known adverse health effects from hard water. Um, and I did look through the literature and what, what is interesting to find, and I almost never find this in researching th uh, contaminants in water, and I almost hesitate to call this a contaminant, it's more like a constituent, um, is that in general, it's thought that hard water is beneficial to health. Um, it's not proven, but there are a number of studies that show that areas with hard water, people uh, do better in terms of cardiovascular disease. Uh, it may be helpful in terms of diabetes, uh, and it, but those are still not definitive, but there are, are definitely no known studies that indicate a strong negative association with a health effect. Um, so we already know the, the main thing in hardness is calcium and magnesium. Calcium and magnesium are essential minerals in our diet. There are minimum amounts of calcium and magnesium that we need to take in. The minimum amount of magnesium is uh, 400 milligrams a day. The highest level here was in the 20s. Um, so again, even if you drank a liter or two a day, you're not even coming close to what you should be taking in. Um, an average banana has 25 milligrams, so that's kind of equivalent to what you would be getting from this water. Calcium, the recommended daily amount is closer to uh, 800 or 1,000 uh, milligrams a day. Obviously, we need it for bones. Uh, an 8-ounce eight eight ounce glass of milk has 350 milligrams of calcium. The highest calcium level was um, somewhere around 80 or 90. Uh, and so you're not even getting a glass of milk from the amount of calcium that's, uh, that's present in this water. Um, so uh, the, the basic, the bottom line is that uh, even though the water may taste funny or may uh, cause your soap not to work, um, it probably doesn't even add a, 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 a very large percentage to what you're getting in your daily diet from all the other sources. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, we'd like to bring up Valley Water. Uh, Representative Donna, are you going to start it off? And uh, to explain the system in Plainville and uh, how it operates and how they operate and what their requirements are. And uh, uh, when Don gets done uh, with that, uh, we'll open it up to uh, questions and comments. So we, we hope to get through this and, and hopefully there'll be, you know, we'll, we'll provide as much time as necessary for people to, uh, to either comment or ask questions. So. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Hello, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> I appreciate you uh, coming out tonight. Uh, I hope that what we have to say uh, continues uh, the education and water in general, and that, that our presentation uh, also helps you understand the water process. 
Uh, what I'd like to do is start off uh, with a slide, uh, and uh, I want to give you a general overview of uh, you know what we do at Valley Water, what we're about, uh, and then uh, as our presentation continues, uh, we hope to uh, get a little bit more specific on some of the issues. But uh, <clears throat> as you probably have seen our building on Northwest Drive, uh, these are our headquarters. And uh, we occupy actually both floors. Uh, the first floor is uh, dedicated to uh, Valley Water Systems. All its personnel are there. And uh, uh, we get everything done through uh, perhaps about uh, seven or eight employees on, located on that first floor. The second floor is uh, uh, occupied by our holding company, uh, New England Service Company. And New England Service Company uh, uh, has uh, other subsidiary water utilities, uh, two of which actually, uh, two of which are actually located in New Hampshire and three uh, in Massachusetts. So we have personnel uh, devoted to uh, those operations. Uh, and we uh, have engineering staff, we have accounting staff, uh, in order to uh, support our Valley Water Systems operation. Uh, next slide, please. I would like to uh, run through just a few facts and figures. Again, this is uh, kind of designed to give you a little bit of a background on, you know, who we are, what we are, what we do. Uh, <clears throat> we started way back in 1884 when Plainville Water Company was uh, established. Uh, and that's particularly the era when uh, the Industrial Revolution started and a lot of uh, water utilities uh, uh, came into existence. Uh, in Plainville, we have roughly uh, 6,800 customers or so located in, uh, also uh, in, located in Southington and Farmington. Uh, we serve a population of uh, 18,000 uh, people, give or take a few. Uh, we have two water supply well fields uh, with uh, multiple high producing uh, and uh, uh, significantly productive uh, wells. Uh, continually, we have uh, 80 miles of uh, water mains and uh, about 600 hydrants which support the uh, public fire protection in town and in Southington and in, in uh, Farmington also. Two water storage tanks. And I'll uh, show those later on in the uh, presentation, uh, uh, having a capacity of about a million gallons each. Um, we're regulated by the uh, Co uh, Connecticut Public Utility uh, Authority, uh, who you've heard uh, previously, as well as the uh, uh, Department of Public Health, uh, w which you have also heard. In addition, we're uh, regulated by uh, the Department of uh, uh, energy and environmental uh, uh, protection. Uh, and so we have uh, masters, essentially, that, uh, that uh, overview our actions on a daily basis and, and on a continuing uh, uh, operation. Uh, the above uh, uh, regulatory authorities, meaning uh, Pura, uh, DPH, and DEEP, as it's known, uh, do, among other things, they uh, approve the uh, rates that we charge. Uh, they tell us, uh, you know, uh, what we can charge in, an, in a, uh, uh, a format of uh, operating costs and investment costs. We also uh, uh, have a DPH, which uh, monitors uh, our water quality uh, on a routine basis. Uh, it, we're in touch with them. We have uh, licensed operators uh, who uh, sample, and as you heard earlier, uh, we split samples uh, during the whole sampling process, and uh, uh, we are very familiar with, with that process, with, with the, the, the sampling operation. In addition, uh, we have DEEP, and their function uh, primarily is uh, the withdrawal of water supplies uh, at both well fields. In other words, we are permitted to uh, withdraw certain amounts of water uh, from our Woodford Ave well field as well as our uh, Johnson Ave well field. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to uh, give you a little overview of how we uh, are put together at Valley Water, uh, we have uh, the folks that you see. Nearly every one of those uh, people that are in those uh, uh, slots there are located on our first floor at uh, Northwest Drive. Uh, we have uh, 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 workloads that uh, uh, come across, you know, in a normal course, uh, course of uh, operating a uh, water utility, and uh, we have the ability to supplement those folks with some of the uh, folks at the uh, holding company level who are on the second floor. In other words, uh, as you can see, we have three uh, field people down there in the bottom left, the operations supervisor and uh, utility techs. So uh, it, according to seasonal demands, construction demands, uh, we have the ability to supplement those people. So that is one of the uh, benefits of, of having just a little bit larger uh, operation. Uh, we have uh, uh, a board of directors, we have uh, uh, field and office uh, people who are all licensed, uh, we have uh, uh, accountants, engineers, uh, all part of the total organization. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a system map uh, for uh, Valley Water Systems, you saw that before. Uh, it shows a location of uh, the, uh, the two well fields we have, the Johnson Ave well field and the Woodford Ave well field. And we, in addition to uh, serving Plainville, we have uh, some uh, customers that are located in Southington as well as Farmington. Uh, we have approximately uh, 6,800 customers, uh, which I think we've mentioned. Uh, we have uh, the, the well fields, as I mentioned, very productive well fields. Uh, we're permitted to uh, uh, withdraw at the Woodford Ave well field approximately 2.17 million gallons a day, as well as at the Johnson Ave well field, we can uh, produce up to a million and a half gallons per day. And these are uh, numbers that are regulated by uh, DEEP. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this uh, slide shows our Maria uh, Road tank and pump station, uh, 1,000, uh, or rather 1 million gallons of uh, water storage capacity. Uh, this uh, functions as uh, a provision for public fire protection. Uh, it uh, also uh, balances uh, peak demands that may occur during very extreme hot weather droughts. Uh, so this is a, a tank that's uh, virtually filled right at the top on a daily basis. The building uh, to the uh, lower left is the Maria Road pump station, red roof. Uh, this uh, provides water to the upper reaches of uh, Ledge Road and uh, View Street. Next slide, please. Uh, again, we have a counterpart to the Maria Road uh, uh, tank, and this is the one at uh, Reliance Road. Uh, down in the lower left, uh, we have uh, the Reliance Road pump station, which serves the uh, Metacomet and the Pinnacle Road area. Uh, the Reliance Road tank, again, is a, has a million gallon uh, storage capacity. Uh, it supplements the Maria Road tank. Uh, and this all goes together with providing uh, very, very significant amounts of public fire protection. And I will just mention that later on uh, about the importance of that. Next slide, please. Uh, these buildings are located at uh, our Woodford Ave well uh, field. The upper left uh, building is uh, one of the wells that's capable of producing about 450 gallons a minute or so. Uh, we have other wells, uh, one of which produces uh, somewhere between 900,000 and a million gallons of water uh, per minute, uh, a per day, actually. Um, these uh, are very important wells that uh, we have at the Woodford Ave well field. 
Uh, the building in the lower right is a chemical treatment plant, uh, and that is uh, uh, scheduled to be replaced by a uh, building which we have under design right now, and that proposed building will essentially replace the function of the uh, Woodford Ave well uh, chemical treatment plant, which you see on, on the lower right. Uh, and I might mention that some of the, uh, the uh, additions that we make to raw water to produce finished water are, uh, are uh, chemicals like uh, chlorine, as an example, fluoride, and phosphate. So these are uh, introduced to the water supply, the raw water supply, to become finished water uh, at both the Johnson Ave uh, treatment plants, which we'll sh uh, show you in a, in a moment, as well as the Woodford Ave plant. Next slide, please. Uh, the Johnson Ave uh, uh, water treatment plant, which is right around the corner here, um, is a uh, building that uh, duplicates the function of the Woodford Ave treatment plant. The, uh, this, this particular treatment plant, and it's a, both a treatment plant and a pump station, in a slide which I'll uh, demonstrate uh, following this, uh, essentially duplicates the Woodford Ave treatment plant. Uh, they, they perform the same function. In, in other words, they uh, pump water into the system. Uh, they, uh, the treatment plant functions as a, a, uh, a process that introduces the, the uh, chemical additions that I had mentioned earlier, namely chlorine, uh, fluoride and, and phosphate. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the interior of the Johnson Ave uh, treatment plant, uh, what we have here are uh, two high lift pumps on the left, and these can alternate uh, depending on uh, the usage in any given day. In other words, uh, they uh, perform what they would call a lead lag function. When one uh, pump stops, then the other one will take over when there's a demand there. Uh, both this station as well as the uh, Woodford Ave plant station can respond to both storage tanks. That would be the Johnson, uh, rather the Reliance Road storage tank, one million gallons, as well as the Maria Ave tank, one million gallons. So that either one supplements the water level in, in both those storage tanks and provide the, uh, the evenness, evenness or consistency of uh, pressure as well as providing uh, all the fire protection that we have in town. Next slide, please. This is a, uh, a typical water main uh, installation that's occurring in town. Uh, we wanted to show you this uh, to uh, let you know uh, that this uh, water main construction and projects like it are capital additions to uh, the, the, our water system, which go on every year. Uh, water is a very capital intensive industry. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, cost that's associated with improvements. Anytime you uh, excavate ground, uh, you have to deal with traffic pavement uh, restoration, uh, any number of things, uh, this becomes very costly. But it's also important to replace uh, aged water mains. Uh, some of the water mains that uh, have been in town uh, have dated back to probably uh, the 1920s. Uh, there was a time when I uh, came on uh, the scene here at the town back in the 90s where we were dealing with a stovepipe issue. And I think that uh, some of our regulators can uh, recollect that. Uh, it was, they were very troublesome. It was not uncommon to have a water break almost daily. And in some, time, in some cases, twice a day, uh, three times a day. Uh, so through investment, we have uh, improved the water system. We've improved the integrity of the system. And uh, we've, it has had its benefits. We probably spend somewhere between uh, 750000 and a million dollars a year just in capital improvements. That's an ongoing uh, expenditure. It's a commitment that you have to make to make sure that the system is reliable and dependable. 
And as a result, uh, what we have is almost uh, virtually no water main breaks, which is almost unheard of these days. Uh, you've read and seen on TV uh, disastrous water main breaks. Uh, we have probably had two water main breaks this past year, which is just phenomenal. But that comes from investment. And it also um, reinforces and provides uh, dependability and reliability to the water system. Those are all good things. Furthermore, um, by virtue of an investment, and it's not only in water mains, uh, we uh, do things for treatment, uh, we provide uh, and we, in we invest in electronic uh, 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 instruments for uh, testing and, and for motor control and so forth. But through this investment, uh, we have uh, really vastly reduced our water loss ratios. As a matter of fact, if you go on to our website, you'll be able to see a, a category that's uh, a category or a metric, I would call it, of uh, the water system performance, which is called non-revenue water. And, and uh, this is a term that you know, uh, our regulators are familiar with. Our, our water loss is very small. It's about a 5% loss, which I think is a great number. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, not only uh, uh, as a result of the, uh, the water main investment, uh, that has helped uh, improve the community, the town's ISO rating. What is the ISO rating? The ISO rating is the insurance service office, which is basically a consultant to insurance underwriters. Insurance underwriters go to ISO and they ask, how is Plainville? And ISO gives them the results through testing that they have done on the system, and that influences uh, uh, insurance rates for the community. But I wanted to um, provide this information. You know, I probably haven't covered all the things that I wanted to uh, mention tonight. Uh, I, I haven't mentioned all the tests that we do on a daily basis. We measure pH, we measure chlorine residuals, we measure uh, iron, and we measure manganese. We report these. Uh, I get reports every morning and review these. Some of these reports go directly to DPH. Uh, it's a routine mandated basis. Uh, but uh, there are many, many things involved in water and uh, I've just scratched the surface. So I hope this helps a little bit. From here, I'd like to introduce uh, Nick Lachance, who works with us and he's gonna get a little bit more specific on what we're doing. And then uh, Nick is going to um, uh, uh, introduce uh, Tom Hansen, who will kind of get in even into more uh, plans that we have. Thank you for uh, uh, listening and thank you for your patience. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to encourage everyone um, up here at the front. Uh, to pick up two handouts that we provided. Uh, the first of which is our annual consumer confidence report that Tom had mentioned earlier in his presentation. Um, this report is sent out to each one of our customers in the month of June, so you should be receiving a 2017 uh, report uh, coming up here, but these are the ones that we provided to you last year. Secondly, uh, we uh, put together what we feel is a, uh, a valuable handout uh, that gives takeaways that we feel are important to each and every one of us that are here. Uh, these, uh, this handout and the bullet points are going to reference the daily and monthly testing we perform as required by the Department of Health. Uh, it's also going to discuss customer service improvements that are going to be uh, started here on the next slide. It's going to discuss preventive maintenance and some of the preventive maintenance measures that we take on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, on an annual basis with our system. And lastly, there's going to be an independent lab report, which we use Tungsus Labs, uh, really to discuss the non-corrosive makeup of the water that is here in town. So the last few months have provided insight uh, to areas of opportunity for our business. So we can improve upon. Just like any other company in today's era, we understand and we know that there are 
um, always opportunities that we can improve upon and it needs to be ingrained in the culture of that company to succeed to look for those opportunities. As a, management, as a management team and as the board of directors of Valley Water, it's our task to ensure that that, that culture is ingrained in each and, every one of our, uh, each and every one of our employees and that they're continuously looking for those opportunities. The bolded points on this slide have all been implemented as a result of direct feedback that we've received over the last few months, um, as well as through brainstorming sessions that we've held internally that we know are um, again, areas of concern for our customers and areas of concern that you know, we really want to tackle firsthand. So the first bullet point here is new water quality job order system. Um, this bullet point deserves its own slide which is going to come next after the current slide that, that we're on. So I'm going to touch on that one in a second. The, the following four bullet points all revolve around what we would characterize as customer service and what we would characterize as uh, how we are going to receive complaints and how we are going to react to complaints. So this for, uh, bullet point number two, uh, in, in my mind, is for us to take a proactive approach to customer service through quarterly uh, customer service training. So this has been implemented just like everything else in this slide going, uh, going forward over the last few months. So. The uh, quarterly customer service training is um, it's a training in which we actually have our frontline partners. So we have some of our customer service reps that feel very, uh, feel conviction toward a specific part of customer service and they lead that particular training. Uh, as well as some uh, parts of the management staff coming in and then leading on another part of training that we feel is important. Uh, the topics that we use for this training is directly taken from customer service surveys that we receive from our, from, from our customers. So I point this out because I want to make sure that um, as we are discussing these changes that have happened and have been implemented over the last few months, the feedback that we receive from our customers is heard. We're using it, I'm using it, Don's using it, to put it toward um, using it as a, as a tool to train and to improve ourselves on. Next is a daily customer service survey performed via telephone. So this, uh, this survey is being performed by our office manager uh, each day. The opportunities that we have to perform this, service, uh, this survey is going to be based off of the in-home work that we performed at our customers. So for instance, if we have a field tech that's coming out to replace one of your meters, uh, which is a pretty routine maintenance that we handle um, daily, uh, we are going to contact the particular customer, ask them what their experience was when they spoke with our customer service rep in the office. Did you have a good experience with that customer service rep? But they're gonna ask you about how your experience was with the field technician, and then overall what your uh, feelings are regarding the service that you're receiving from Valley Water. The fourth one is customer service surveys are now available online. It was important to us as we were going through this process over the last few months to um, understand that not necessarily every particular customer is going to want to be identified. Not necessarily everybody wants to have a name associated with a particular concern or issue or complaint that they might have. So the online customer service survey was our opportunity to give everybody a voice uh, in, an, in an anonymous way that they can still give us that information um, and then we can look at it as a management team and utilize it in trainings going forward. So what I've just described is it, it's, a, it's a lot of information, it's a lot of data that we're trying to pull. So what are we doing with this data? Uh, this last bullet point speaks to that in which finally with the feedback, uh, we've implemented what you can characterize as a customer satisfaction index. So it's, it's basically a scorecard that we can put together and we can identify the areas that we're doing really well in and the areas that we have opportunity in. Each month, we can look at that month over month to ensure that A, either we're improving or if there's uh, a decline, then we need to address that through training, we need to address that through on the job training between supervisor and customer service rep, or if it's out in the field, then that's again another opportunity for 
on the job training between the operations supervisor and the particular field tech. So to sum this up, I guess I just want to make sure and uh, hopefully convey that the feedback that we receive, again, is being used and, and I'm soliciting that feedback so that we can improve upon uh, what we're currently doing. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before on, on the previous slide, there's this uh, new customer service protocol that we want to use when it comes to water quality concerns. So this slide illustrates what that is. And it's essentially, again, it's our new water quality and service concern process um, that has been implemented over the last few months. So um, the reason for this particular protocol that we are implementing is so that we can ensure that there's a systematic approach to ensure each customer's concern is understood at the point of us coming out and, and visiting with each customer, but then it's also addressed and that's followed up on. Um, as, it, as we can all say here today, there is no point in listening if we're not going to do anything about it. So we need to make sure that we are addressing the concern um, either at the point of the, uh, of the meeting at the customer's house or um, internally so that we can, we can rectify. Uh, first off, we've created um, essentially a new, a new uh, job code, if you, if you will. So that call is logged into the system specifically as a water quality concern. So what that means to us, or what that means internally is, if we're logging as a water quality concern, it's going to stand out amongst um, if there's a, a collections call or if there's a, a call for uh, a real estate transfer, just, a, just to name a couple of calls that we, normally, uh, that we normally receive each day. So once that call has been flagged as a water quality uh, concern, the customer service rep is then tasked with asking and making sure, if, at all, if possible, that we can um, set an in-home appointment with a field tech. So that in-home appointment is essential for us to be able to diagnose and um, also just to, just to understand and make sure that we can clarify what the particular concern is, that we can understand what that concern is and then address it. Uh, a job order is created and tracked in our system to ensure completion from time of complaint to end resolution. So. Um, with this piece, we're, we're trying to create accountability that we can track that particular concern uh, from start to end. Um, at the point of the particular in-home meeting, uh, in appointment, the field tech will discuss concerns specifically that the customer has and will perform the following tests. So we're going to look at uh, pH levels. So we're, so we're actually going to pull a physical sample out of your uh, sink, out of your, your kitchen faucet. We're going to take a look at the, the pH level. We are going to test for chlorine residual. If applicable, we're going to look at the water pressure. Uh, we'll do a color and clarity, so a visual test, as well as taste and odor. So we'll, again, these are kind of physical parameters that we're looking at. Um, and again, the idea with this is that it's on-site testing to provide immediate feedback. So we're able to have that immediate conversation with the customer. Um, and or look for immediate action for resolution. So we understand that, yes, there is something going on here. We do need to take a look at it, whether there's um, any number of events that could happen at that point. Uh, the field tech is to report their findings to and discuss recommendations, again, directly with the customer at that point. Moving along, job order is filled in with information gathered and findings and noted on the customer files. So this is important to create what we want to call a, a book for each customer. So if there is continuous ongoing concerns um, and either we are finding issues when we go out or if we're not finding issues going out, at least we have that history to be able to fall back on and to be able to look at and, and understand. Lastly, to close out the entire system, the president, Don, or the operations supervisor will verify information is sufficient to close the job order. And if it's not, they will require additional information or additional steps from that field tech to ensure that uh, the resolution is complete. So um, I think at the end of this, what this really does is it, it provides accountability to the office staff, to our field staff, and to our supervisors for any quality concern, and it has been um, addressed appropriately. Next slide. This is just a sample. I just want to I just want to put this up there, just so that everybody uh, can see a visual sample of what 
the actual um, customer service survey document looks like. This is, this is the exact sample that you'll find online on our website. Um, again, it's just valley, valleywatersystems.com. Um, you can do this anonymously on the website. Uh, this is also the exact same survey that our office manager uh, will ask you when she's coming out, or, I'm sorry, when she's calling you uh, over the telephone if you just happen to have an appointment. Um, and then lastly, this is also at the front desk, so if anybody's come into our office and has paid their water bill in person, uh, this, sur this, this, this survey is right there at the front desk as well for you to be able to fill out. So that concludes my portion of the presentation, so I'd like to turn it over to Tom at this point. All right, I'm last and I only have two slides. Um, so, and, and we're gonna go to a and a of course, but maybe this will answer some questions beforehand. Um, what, what, what are we gonna do next? Well, I, I'm, an, I'm an engineer. I don't actually, I'm not employed by Valley Water Systems, but I'm hired by them to uh, do some engineering work and some analysis. And Don's marching orders to me were, we're gonna look at any and all alternatives to address hardness. And um, as we've already heard, hardness is a characteristic of our water. We characterize it as very hard here in Plainville. And we understand the aesthetic concerns and that's why we're all here because we know it's of concern to our customers. So we're gonna evaluate any and all techniques. Those techniques might be structural, a treatment plant. It might be blending alternatives to reduce hardness um, and other technologies or ideas that come up across to, uh, to address that concern specifically. Um, the engineering analysis is to look at flows, look at hardness coming from the wells, compare the water quality at the wells, look at how it's distributed in the system and develop alternatives to lower that overall hardness level from very hard to something more acceptable. Water chemistry is essential. Um, we, we need to know what the impact will be of changing the water quality at the wellhead when we distribute into the system. Look, of course, for any ancillary concerns or problems that might come up that we didn't anticipate. Um, you can't just willy-nilly go changing water chemistry without understanding how that might affect other parameters in the system, and that's our job. The effectiveness of the treatment, obviously the idea is to lower hardness, but by how much? Um, the hardness is, is there, it's very hard. Um, how effective are the different treatment techniques or the blending techniques? Uh, how effective are they at getting the hardness down to a level that causes fewer aesthetic problems to the customers? And that's clearly an element of the analysis. The technical feasibility, you know, there are limitations. The Johnson Avenue site doesn't have a lot of room. Woodford Area Avenue does have a lot of room. Um, we need sewer access for some of these alternatives because they generate a waste product. Um, there may be electrical load concerns, et cetera, et cetera. So the technical feasibility of each of these alternatives will have to take all that into consideration. And regulatory approvals. We do everything in partnership with the DPH and Pura. Um, we will be working with them and say, is this an approvable technology? Can we go forward with this particular um, process? Um, what concerns do you have and what, what are the benefits? And, and make a trade-off or a comparison there between the regulatory concerns and the benefits to our customers. And obviously, we have to determine what the rate impacts would be. I mean, this, this is going to cost money, maybe a certain amount of money, maybe a lot more money, depending on what the engineering analysis shows is the best all, overall solution. So this capital cost incurred for building a, a treatment plant, and there are operating costs associated with operating the plant and disposing of residuals and that type of thing. All of this comes together in an engineering analysis that will hopefully come up with the best, most effective, suitable alternative for reducing hardness in the valley water system. 
And this is kind of goes right along with the customer service initiatives that uh, Nick and Don have developed. They want the customers, the Valley Water customers, to be part of that decision-making process. So at the end of the engineering analysis, and we develop several alternatives, and we can quantify how the hardness will be reduced under each of those alternatives, and we can quantify the rate impact, we're going to send that information to the customers in the form of a survey or questionnaire or some kind of a feedback mechanism to say, yes, we're willing to, to, to see these rates change for that level of improvement in water quality as it refers to hardness. So this is going to take some time, but we, we, we're anticipating um, in a six-month time frame that this will all be laid out in a very understandable, straightforward format for all of Valley Water customers to come back and say, okay, this looks like an alternative we'd like to, to move forward with. Because remember, this is not so much regulatory driven, the hardness is, as it is a customer service driven problem. And um, we understand the problem and the reason we're here is because we don't like these aesthetic issues that come from hardness. Um, but understanding now a little bit more about the health effects or the lack of health issues associated with it might help you to help us make that decision. Um, and as always, um, Valley Water will be sharing this information uh, in mailings and uh, other outreach programs associated with the new customer service uh, program. And I just have one more slide. Okay, so here's kind of a picture of what Tom was talking about when we, we did our sampling. So as an engineer, I, I like this stuff. I, I realize the traffic light is upside down. I'm gonna explain that in a second. But what I did was I, I said, well, Okay, here's our results, let's see what it looks like on the map. And this is kind of the very first step of an engineering analysis. So the green dots are, first of all, all the water is very hard. There's, there's no getting away from it. But hard is kind of a relative thing when you look at a water system. So um, the green uh, spots were places we tested under 200 parts per million in the system. The, Orange was 200 to 250, and then the red was over, over 250 parts per million. And I, I've put these on this map, um, and you can also see the two blue diamonds. Those are where our supplies are. Uh, as Don showed earlier, Johnson Avenue up there toward the top, and Woodford down toward the middle of the system. And right away we can see uh, something which maybe was intuitive, um, at first glance, but now you can actually see it in, in black and white or in red and green if you want. But most of our hardness, our, our highest levels of hardness issues are close to the Woodford field. So, you know, we begin to think about, okay, is, is there something we do at Woodford that will have a beneficial impact throughout the system when we blend it with Johnson? Or, um, you know, what can we do blending the two systems as they are now together to kind of ameliorate those high, those higher hardness level areas and get them down to a more moderately high, <laughs> or it, it's pretty high everywhere. So we're not just running off and saying we're gonna build a treatment plant. First, we wanna understand the problem and see if there are alternatives that we can apply operationally to improve the situation, which we can do in relatively short order. Um, and if a treatment plan is, on, is, is in the future, that's when we will come back with that survey to tell you, you know, this is what it costs and this is the benefit for it. So, um, like I say, I'm, I'm finished, two slides, two and done. Uh, I'm, I think I'll turn it back to, do you want to take it, Don, or Mr. Lee? I'll take it. Okay. So thank you for your attention.
Uh, first off, I want to thank you for your patience, uh, for, for uh, you know, listening to this presentation. I think we all felt, from the people who've been discussing this for the last couple of months, that it was important that we're all on the same page as far as how things operate, what the requirements are, and, and, and what, you know, how, how, our, how this, this system operates. And that once we all have that base information, then I think we can have a, a more intelligent discussion about where do we go from here. I hope you could also see that you know a lot of work has been done as a result of uh, feedback that we've received over the last couple of months. With that in mind, uh, we're now going to uh, turn it over to to you. And and the way I'd like to do that is uh, Scott has a has a microphone or will get a microphone that uh, is remote. Uh, if you have a question, Will will bring the microphone to you so you don't have to come up front if you don't want to. And uh, uh, you can either ask your question or make your comment. If you have a question, we'll try to find you know the appropriate person to uh, you know to help answer that question. So uh, uh, hopefully you still have some questions. I, I, I'd be surprised if we answered them all uh, as part of the process. But this is your opportunity to uh, to ask questions and make comments. So uh, Scott, there's a gentleman over here. Hi, <clears throat> thank you, Dan Butler, uh, Pickney Avenue in Plainville. Um, the map that's up on the uh, screen now confirms what I've heard anecdotally, and that is people who live near the uh, northern part of town and get their water from the Johnson Avenue uh, pump station or from the Johnson Avenue well do not experience the same problems or the problems that the people who live in the lower section of town experience. I have relatives who live up in that section. They don't have problems with their um, plumbing, with their water, with um, the shower heads. Um, so my question is, at this point, is there a difference in the way the water is being distributed from the Johnson Avenue site uh, versus the Woodford Avenue site that is making the difference. Don, do you have somebody who can answer that question? Yeah, I can attempt to answer that if I may. Come on up front, Don. And just so you know, all the slides that you saw this evening are going to be posted online. Uh, they'll be online uh, tomorrow, uh, so you can, you can get them. If you don't have access to uh, the Internet, and you just contact my office, call my office, we'll mail them to you. So, uh, you know, we didn't make enough, you know, we didn't know how many copies to make, but uh, They'll be online if you have any questions or you, or you want your own copy, uh, we'll, we'll send them to you as well. So, Don, you want to come up? And... Uh, the uh, question came from Dan. Dan, um, good question. I appreciate it. Uh, the question, as I understood it, was uh, are we getting more hardness uh, as a result of uh, those customers? Are, are those customers closer to the Woodford Ave supply experiencing more difficulty than, say, the Johnson Ave uh, well field? Is that? That's not a question. Uh, question could you, is, is there a difference? Is there a difference in the way the water is being distributed from the Johnson Avenue site than the Woodford Avenue site that is causing? the difference that we can visibly see on the map. In other words, are there filters in place at the Johnson Avenue? Is there something that's being done now that can be done at the Woodford Avenue site? Oh, thank you for the clarification. Uh, what is happening is that the Johnson Ave site has less hardness than the Woodford Ave site, first of all. And those customers who are closer to the Woodford Ave site, as the map portrays, uh, are experiencing more hardness. So specifically, there is no difference in the way the either uh, treatment plant is distributing the water. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, the harder water coming from Woodford Ave uh, as opposed to that coming from Johnson Ave. Now, as Tom alluded to, uh, we can, there are some certain distribution improvements or, uh, uh, co or shall I say configurations that we may be able to implement that can more uniformly distribute the water from both supplies. But the answer is there's really no difference. The water 
is treated in the same fashion at either well field. It's just a, a question of uh, harder water coming from the Woodford Ave uh, well field. Is that responsive to your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Anybody else have a question or comment they want? Scott spotted somebody over here, and then we'll get you, sir. Uh, hi, Joshua Payne, uh, Park Street. Uh, on the uh, sheet that we were given earlier, it says that the local and uh, state department of health both have a 0.04 for iron and manganese, and over on the ammonia, it's a 0.05 while the uh, valley water samples have a different number throughout, is there like a explanation for that? Lori, uh, Lori right. is that from the Department of Public Health? Want, want to take that? I, I think it'd be better if they answer that question. I agree. So uh, I think your question has to do with detection limits. It says less than on, on most of those. And um, the two labs basically just have slightly different detection limits. So uh, they use Tunxis that has a, di a different detection limit than our state lab in Rocky Hill. Does that answer your question? Or? Okay. Scott, there's a gentleman down here with his hand raised. I live in the uh, Woodford Avenue area. Um, I know that they've replaced the water mains in the Woodford Avenue area. What about the side streets that some of us live on? Why haven't those been replaced? I heard the question, so thank you. <laughs> um, as you know, uh, we've, who asked, who asked the question, please? Uh, as you know, we had a slide showing uh, the construction taking place at, at a, uh, a roadway in Plainville. Um, we are currently doing a job on Trumbull Ave. Uh, I think we're replacing about 5,000 feet of aged uh, piping. It's a little cast iron pipe with funny joints, and we've had, uh, a, a, you know, it's been problematic. Uh, we're doing that also in anticipation of the paving program that the town has, which may occur this year and may also occur next year, but we want to be in and out of that Trumbull Ave. Uh, this all comes down to uh, capital funds. I appreciate your question. I love it. I'd like to replace everything in, in a distribution system, but we just do not have the funds, and we have to be careful how we uh, construct and allocate uh, capital, so to speak because we want to moderate our construction program with rates. We haven't had a rate increase uh, since 2010, and I'm very happy about that, and I'm sure everybody else is. But it's a balancing act with capital. That's the long answer. The short answer is it's just a question of uh, money. Just one more question. Um, I have called in the past, had Valley Water come out to my house, um, and I was scolded because I put a whole house water filtration system after my appliances and everything were destroyed. Mm -hmm. And since then, it's gotten even worse. So um, I'm definitely going to be going through your customer program to see what we can do because it's not that I can't drink my water, it's that every two months my filter is so clogged that I can't even it won't, the water won't run. I have to change the filter. And when I brought you folks out before, somebody came out, they looked things over, they said everything is fine, and they walked away. And so for years now, I've been using my own money to replace filters every two months, and it's becoming ridiculous. Um, all I can say is I'm thrilled that Plainville water is great. I just hope someday mine can get great. I, I just want to respond to, to uh, the first part of your question. Did I hear you say you were scolded? Yes. That bothers me. 
Uh, this is the first uh, uh, I have heard. Have you called the company recently relative to your problem? No, okay. Okay, uh, your point's well taken. Uh, you know, we're dealing with hard water. We've had hard water since 1884. Nothing's changed. Uh, aerial groundwater supplies are virtually hard also. That's still not a reason for us to ignore the problem. As Tom pointed out, we are going to look at all the alternatives and we're going to explore and see what these costs are uh, to implement what we think is the most effective solution. Uh, the issue, as you point out, is one of hardness. And uh, the consequences and the, the symptoms of that hardness show up in, in particulate matter. Uh, the, the, it can occur in water heaters. Uh, it can occur in, in aerators. And some of the things that can be done uh, that aerators can be removed and cleaned. That's, that's an easy fix. Uh, water heaters, on the other hand, they can be drained, and they probably should be drained at least annually and, and preferably semi-annually. That's going to extend the life of the water heater. Uh, filters um, in, in Plainville are designed to soften the water, and there are uh, filters in Plainville. As a matter of fact, uh, our office manager has a softener. And uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's symptomatic of hard water, which is, which is uh, extensive th throughout the system. Uh, I don't want to name other utilities, but uh, in, and, um, it, it's, it's hardness is a problem. And I think overall, I think this whole issue that has come about is, relates directly to hardness. Uh, we're concerned about it. Uh, we want to do something about it to the extent that our customers will allow us. But you, your point is not forgotten. We're not ignoring it. I would appreciate it if you could give us a call and meet personally so that uh, your complaints are registered and we can kind of gather data and, and, and be more effective in, in what the future holds for improvements. Uh, Carol Nicolucci, I live on Condale Lane, so I'm in the Woodford area. Um, I have two questions, please. I appreciate your honesty and openness, but could you please list maybe on your website some resources to help us with the hard water, ways to soften it, ways to drain a water heater. I mean, some real help on your website. Um, what filters we might use for those of us who don't know anything about it. And my second question is, has there ever been anyone looking at the Tommaso site? They're literally moving a mountain over there, blasting and grinding and, I mean, and we look at the difference on the two, on the chart there. It, does Tommaso have an effect on the hardness of our water in this part of the town? First off, it's, it's Tilcon. Tilcon. We don't want to, we want to make sure we get the right. In my, my Italian father's day, it was Tommaso. It was at one time. Uh, the first, first question is a great question because we were discussing that very same thing. Uh, as a matter of fact, today, I think Nick uh, was discussing it, and uh, one of uh, our office people, our customer service people, said, let us put something on the website, preventative measures that can be taken to uh, mitigate the effects of hardness, i.e. Uh, draining water, uh, hot water tanks, um, dishwashers, uh, uh, you know, or, aerators and so Or what forth. is symptomatic in our appliances? What shows up when our appliance is being affected by hard water? Uh, I mean, uh, in simplistic terms that we can understand. I was a teacher I, for 38 years and you need to reach a lot of learning styles, so make it as simple as possible. Uh, I think it was explained earlier that uh, uh, scaling results, that's, that's the symptom of hard water. Uh, and it, 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 comes from, uh, it's, uh, it comes from calcium carbonate, which is a, uh, a mineral in, in groundwater supplies, as well as uh, magnesium. Uh, there are others that are much more uh, expert on this than I am. I, I plead you know, some ignorance on this. 
but I, from what I understand, uh, well, Nick's, Nick is going to take over here. No, no it's, I, I guess I just want to clarify. I just want to make sure that I'm hearing you correctly. You're looking to ensure that uh, basically you can catch it before it's too late. Yes, I am. Okay. All right. Yeah. And how so, do I, what do I look for? Sure. Sure. No, absolutely. Yeah, that's something that, that's, that's something that we can, we can put In simplistic terms. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I know about the white spots. Yeah, I can, I can compile something and put that onto the website for you. Great. I think there's a second part to that question, too. Uh, the question about Tilcon uh, it, the, moving uh, the mountain, and as far does as that we, have an effect on the well? We, we believe it has no effect on the water. Uh, you know, uh, Woodford Ave wells are extremely deep, and uh, I, don't, I don't believe there's any impact on it. The water quality has not changed as uh, Tilcon has, uh, uh, you know, uh, gone through its operations over the years. I hope that answers your question. Sure. <laughs> Who's next? Uh, we're just going to get some other people first. We'll, we'll get to you. Hi. I'm Julie Lindquist. I live actually um, right behind us in Samuels Crossing, and I'm a brand new resident to Plainville. Um, I grew up just a few blocks away in Bristol with absolutely wonderful water. Um, I left for about 20 years, lived across the country, I've never had an issue with water. I came back to build my dream home, beautiful, very expensive home in Samuels Crossing, and I move in and discover I have this miserably hard water. Um, luckily enough, I knew at the beginning, and so I installed the softener immediately before I had any issues. Um, unfortunately, now this $1,000 softener makes my water so soft, I can't get the soap off. So while it's a feeling and you're truly not still soapy, I don't know if any of you had to deal with that, but it's miserable. I also pretty much exclusively only drink water. Um, I try to be really healthy and hydrate and I work from home. So I drink water all day, every day, and it's miserable. So for me, moving to Plainville has been horrible and miserable, and I can't believe two blocks away for 30 something years that I never had this issue. So the bottom line that I'm leaving this meeting with, the messaging is, you're gonna to try to work on it, which is wonderful. You've been very transparent, which is wonderful. I can appreciate um, the effort and the thoughtfulness that has gone into this meeting in terms of the information you've provided. But what I'm really hearing and the message I'm leaving with is you're gonna work on this, but to the uh, effect that your customers will allow you to, meaning you're gonna pass the cost on to us. I'm already paying the cost, like the gentleman here mentioned, and it's really not helping me. The softer water is actually worse almost. So I feel like there's really no resolution, and I feel a little bit lost and frustrated um, and a little patronized by the continual effect of it's really healthy. There are no uh, you know, negative effects. Well, really, it's my quality of life, and um, a single woman just starting off my life in my dream home, and it's really sad. So it's frustrating to hear that even if you come up with a resolution, you're only going to pass the cost on to me. Um, I don't know what to really do with that. So again, I appreciate the thoughtfulness in all of this, but at the end of the day, I shouldn't have to pay even more than I've already been paying for a basic human need. Um, when around the corner my whole life, it was you know, taken for granted. So more of a comment than anything else. Scott, there was somebody, gentleman down here, I think. Yeah, my, my name is Bill Brown. I live on Trumbull Avenue, where we're, where we're all currently enjoying the uh, water main replacement project. But uh, regarding the, the distribution, where I know, I believe you said the Woodford Avenue wells produ can produce more on a daily basis than the Johnson Avenue. The areas that, well, like from where I am, Farmington Avenue area up north, I'm. Am I getting my water from the Johnson Avenue wells, or, and is that really the way it always is? I know there's a, you guys have a building on Trumbull Avenue, which I've always assumed was a pump station. Um, but it's, generally speaking, you know, does the Woodford Avenue water stay in the, the red area, and the rest of the area gets Johnson Avenue, and they don't really mix unless something, that, I assume if Johnson Avenue wells were out of commission or something, then I'd be getting Woodford Avenue water. But 
That's my question. <laughs> uh, well, the, you, the question, I think one of them was, uh, are you getting Johnson Ave water on Trumbull Ave? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and the answer is yes. Uh, and, and just to, to supplement that answer, and to let you know how uh, the system operates, we can control the amount of water that comes from Johnson Ave into the system and regulate that, modulate it, as well as uh, the water that comes out of Woodford Ave. As a matter of fact, we rely more on the Johnson Ave because it is uh, less hard water. So uh, you are getting Johnson Ave water that probably goes through uh, the Reliance Road tank and uh, maybe directly into the distribution system. Even though the Woodford Ave is capable of producing more water, uh, we rely on the Johnson Ave system. I'd like to make a point as well. Uh, who, who has the next question, just so Scott can move towards you? But before we get there, um, you heard earlier when they talked about one of the options would be blended. There are some interconnections between the Plainville or the, you know, the Valley Water System and the New Britain Water System, which is primarily a reservoir system. Uh, and, and when we talk about blending, uh, uh, that's one of the things that the engineers are going to look at is, is, is the possibility of, of, of maybe blending some waters together as far as that is concerned. So, uh, ma'am, with regards to your softener, have you gotten a hardness, a soft, a hardness test on your water recently? Because it, be it may be too, you know, your water may be too soft, you know, and, and it, maybe it's, it's overreacting to, to what's there. But I, I don't know. You may, you may want to check that out. But, um, Scott? Were you done, sir? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Gail, I think you had a question. Okay. Um, I just have a comment, well, a couple comments. Uh, I lived in town in an apartment building for tw the same one for 20 years, and I haven't drunk the water. I spend four to $600 a year on water. I won't give my cats the water, and this program didn't make me feel better. I have osteoporosis, but I'm not going to drink the water to feel better. <laughs> um, I just, um, I, I'm wondering, like this lady here, could some of the particulate from the, 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 the digging, could that get into the water? And the other question is, have they considered another location? Oh, my, my third question, and that's a, is how old are those buildings that are, you know, the pumps, how old are those? Uh, let me try to answer the, the last question first. Was your question how old yes. are the water mains? Yeah. Uh, how old are the pumps, the, the, the treatment centers, how old are those? Uh, the uh, Johnson Ave uh, treatment plant was uh, constructed in 1992, so it's relatively new. Still current state-of-the-art technology. Uh, water mains between Johnson Ave and, and uh, Woodford Ave uh, relatively new, not every one of them. Uh, we recognize that some have to be replaced. But essentially, if I use the term ductile iron, uh, that is uh, probably the, the, the state-of-the-art pipe material that's used. The system basically is, uh, is replete, if you will, with ductile iron. We've done that much replacement. Woodford Ave buildings are older. They looked older in the picture. We're going to replace the. Uh, About know, what year were they built? Though? Pardon me. What year? What year? Um, I, I'm kind of guessing here. I think probably in the 1940s or 50s uh, that building was constructed, and we recognize that. We demolished uh, a an ancillary building there. Mm -hmm. uh, we have plans to replace the current building, which is used uh, is a uh, treatment plant. Uh, in injecting, uh, you know, the chlorine, the fluoride, mm -hmm. and the phosphate that we spoke of. Uh, but this is this is in progress. Uh, so to answer your question, we're doing as many things as we can, uh, and at the same time, time trying to balance and be, uh, you know, come within you know the capital that we have to to spend each year. Have, but have they considered looking for another location, what would, which would be near the pipes, so well, it would be difficult, you know, just to build um, uh, the, the, well, you know, just a new location. Uh, I don't for think the Woodford, say for the Woodford, since it is so old. Uh, I, I don't think the location is going to have any impact. 
on where we build the treatment plant? Is that what, what your question is? Yeah, or where you're getting the water from, inside from the Woodford, you know, maybe a, a place that's further away. Uh, well, th that would be part of the study. Okay. Um, we'll evaluate it. We're going to evaluate all options, as, as Tom mentioned. And, uh, you know, we're not uh, resistant. Uh, we haven't got any preconceived notions here. We want a very objective engineering study. It's like, I'd like to put a filter in, but the pipes are so bad I can't. And I don't like the idea of having a softener because I don't like adding chemicals to my water. So I want to stay. So I buy bottled water all the time. And I had to rinse my berries off tonight with that. I don't even like to wash the dishes with it. So anyhow, that's it. OK. One of the things that I've learned during this process is that as much as possible, the, the water company tries to loop their system so that the water keeps moving. And, and what they find is, is the more that water moves, the, the more better chance that you're going to have a better quality. And if you're, if you're on a dead end street or, or in an area that doesn't use that much water uh, on a regular basis, then that, those are the ones that also tend to, uh, to, to have, you know, uh, worse problems. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is for you, Mr. Lee. Um, you mentioned the blending of the water with the New Britain water system. I'm eagerly awaiting the outcome of this study. I expect we're going to see sticker shock. And my question to you is, is the town, or has the town looked in the past, or will it look to another source other than getting our water from the ground of Plainville? Can we get water from New Britain Reservoir or other sources that are not groundwater? Yeah, and you know, in the operation of a, of a private water company, the, you know, they're overseen by, you know, Pura in terms of, you know, rates and, and uh, you know, uh, capital, you know, investments and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, so the town really isn't involved in that type of process. We can certainly help facilitate it and, and make sure that all of the uh, issues are looked at. Um, and, you know, New Britain, New Britain Water Company had some issues this year with, with, with supply. And uh, uh, that's one thing, if there's one thing that, uh, you, know, the, you know, the Valley Water System had was, you know, we didn't have any, you know, Valley Water didn't have any supply issues, you know, even during the drought. So there was plenty of water available. Uh, you know, it's questionable about, with regards to some people, in the, you know, wanting to drink the water. But, uh, uh, well, you know, so I, I think it, it will be explored, but it's going to have to be negotiated if that's actually a preferred option. Okay, well, I guess as a follow-up then, how much say does the town of Plainville have in who provides its water? Very little. Very little. It's more, it's more determined at the state level. Okay. Is there, is there somebody from Pure want to take, you know, help us with that? I mean, am I saying anything that's inaccurate? You're not saying anything that's inaccurate. Okay. All right. It's really, it's really, it's really regulated at the state level. Uh, you know, they determine who gets the franchise for providing water in the individual towns. You know, who, you know, and uh, it's done through a, uh, through a process. Anybody else? And then we'll come back over here. It's giving Scott a little bit of a uh, walk around here. That's why we have the younger people do this. Hey, good evening. Uh, my name's Tom Stepp and I live uh, over near the Woodford, I guess, well source. Um, I guess I want to thank you guys for coming out tonight and talking to us, but I have similar concerns as to the, the young lady back there that a lot of things that you were saying tonight is a little bit patronizing. Um, just with the fact that we all have problems here and you're telling us what you're doing, what the plan is, but you're not necessarily telling us, you know, what the concerning things in our water may be. Calcium and magnesium, you say, is good for our diets, but what about the, you know, chemicals that may be seeping through the ground into the water supply beneath our feet, uh, excuse me, beneath our feet, and what you're doing maybe to remove that, specifically, I guess, uh, the herbicides and pesticides that we all use to take care of our lawn and, and kill the bugs that are, um, you know, uh, in the grass and in, in, in wherever. Um, how that gets down into the water and how 
and what you guys would do to remove those things. Um, that, that's, a, I think, the most concern to me because, uh, like this woman over here with the concern for chemical and chemicals in the water, how you guys would test for that and you know, even leave it out of your, your stat sheet here. You would include things like odor, but not bacteria or herbicide, pesticide, or even fluoride for that matter. It's an added chemical in our water and we have no way of knowing how much is in it unless we go independently test for it. Okay, a couple things, and I'm gonna call somebody here from the Department of Public Health to, to you know, talk about some of those issues. But I, but I will let you know that all of these tests that were recently done, the water company is also required to do tests for some of those uh, organic and inorganic uh, materials that you're, that you're you know, concerned about. So, like, so those tests are done uh, on a fairly regular basis, but I'm gonna bring somebody from the Department of Public Health who could you know, address specifically uh, what you just brought forward. Good question, good question. Thank you. Um, there's over 90 contaminants that are tested for. These were specific to what we were finding. This, this, that's why these are on this spreadsheet. We wouldn't have enough room on eight spreadsheets to show everything else that's tested for. Uh, there's, there's volatile organics, there's inorganics, there's pesticides, there's a whole host of other things. There's radionuclides that are tested for. Fluoride sample results. That information uh, statewide, not only Valley, but statewide, all those large systems test for all of those 90 contaminants. Most of those are requirements in the Safe Drinking Water Act. I mentioned there's all these different rules. There's lead and copper, there's groundwater rule. There's all of these different rules that, that deal with a different variety of contaminants that are out there, man-made um, as well as natural. Um, so all of that information is sent electronically when they do this testing. And testing, is, as Don mentioned, is, is going on daily, is going on weekly, going on monthly, quarterly, every six months, every three years. I mean, all that information, dependent upon the different contaminant, um, uh, it, it, that information is, is coming to us electronically in the health department. We store all that information in our data system and our people analyze whether or not those are meeting the maximum contaminant levels or not. And if they, if they do get above that maximum contaminant level, we're working with the water company to address it, and they have to address the issue. So if there's an exceedance anywhere within those maximum, maximum levels, the water company has, is, has to be responsible. Now, specifically, that information, um, either we could share that or the water company, I'll turn it to Don, to share that information with you, because that's something, that's a great question. Because not only uh, on the spreadsheet, there's, there's just a small amount of information there versus the, the, an awful lot of data that's going on and, and testing that's going on constantly. So uh, I'll turn it over to Don. And what we, what we could do is share our data with you. We could uh, get it over to the town and see, you know, share with you over the last three years what the results are that we have in our data system. And certainly, you know, Don could take that, all, take that on as well. So Don, if you want to. Um, it, a great question, as uh, Laurie said. Uh, first of all, we uh, produce a consumer confidence report every year annually. It has to be in the hands of the consumers July 1st. We're preparing that right now. We're going to mention that we exceeded as an example uh, uh, on, a, on an average basis sodium. I think we had some numbers around 30, 35 uh, parts per million. Uh, but notwithstanding that, uh, we test for pesticides uh, on a continual basis. We uh, test for uh, volatile organic compounds, um, and we test daily uh, for bacteria. Uh, chlorine residuals are a good indicator. We get uh, reports weekly from Tungsus Lab, uh, independent lab. We have no control over them, certified by uh, uh, the state. Uh, they discuss uh, and, and tell us, uh, you know, if we had any coliform, as an example. Um, some of the more exotic uh, contaminants uh, that you mentioned, uh, we, we test for on a periodic basis. It could be quarterly, it could be yearly. Uh, that's one of the things that uh, is a, takes a major part 
of our operation of the, any water system, not only us, but everybody. Everybody's faced with this. And, and rightly so. I mean, we're talking about the health uh, effects that, you know, from ingestion of water that comes out of municipal uh, public supplies. So, uh, and I get concerned about this. Uh, I'm the first one that receives these results. They go next to the field supervisor, and then they go right to the front office and we do what we call compliance reporting on a, on a regular basis. So I think your fears are, uh, uh, you know, a, a little bit uh, overblown on this, if I may use that expression. I, I don't think there's anything to worry about relative to uh, contaminants, the safety of the water. Uh, what we have here is really an aesthetic issue, and, and that's really the hardness issue, and, and we're trying to address that. Thank you. Just real quick then, uh, I appreciate the, you know, the tests that you do, but can you make those available to me, not just the, the basic uh, annual reports? Yeah, we'll make sure they get reports. up. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get access to them, the town, and we will put them up on our website. And if, I, if, if you don't mind, just, just telling us what, what type of detergents and things you put into the water to, I guess, um, let's just say clean or kill uh, any organic or, or, or anything that may be in the water, what else would you add into the water supply that, that we would be ingesting? The only thing that we add to raw water uh, is to, uh, to comply with uh, 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 disinfection, uh, to, to make sure that we're in compliance with uh, uh, all the parameters that are uh, part of the uh, state's drinking water requirements. So to be specific, uh, chlorine, fluoride, and phosphate. The chlorine uh, we measure daily at, the, at each plant. I think uh, uh, we run about a 45 uh, uh, parts per million uh, total chlorine residual and about what you would say, uh, what, what we would call 40 parts per million uh, free chlorine residual. So that's the chlorine. In addition, we measure what the chlorine residual at certain locations is out in the distribution system because we want to make sure that the chlorine residual is getting out there. Now, chlorine residuals are important to us. They're a, they're a defense against bacteria. That's really uh, the, the reason for chlorination. Uh, fluoride, uh, I'm not sure how that originated, but uh, we uh, measure fluoride on a daily basis. And it, the last I knew, uh, our limits were uh, somewhere between 0.8 parts per million and 1.2 parts per million. And so we monitor that through metering pumps, and we we uh, calibrate those meter pumps if you know if we see a trend. But we're consistently in between in with those limits. Uh, so that's that's pretty much what we do. Thank you. And, and just one further thing, I would be happy to supply and share with you um, all the test results that we have. I think that was important to you. It's all public information. Be happy to do that. Oh, well, my name is George. Um, at my parents' house, we had to replace the furnace in there twice within 14 years. And the only explanation that the pump, because the, the water tanks in there were eaten through, and the plumber says, this has been a known fact in Plainville for a very long time, that the, this water is just bad for anything. And my question is, what took so long to get to this point? If we've known this water has been hard for all these years, why are we just now getting into looking for solutions? It took a push of people, apparently, to do it, but this is something that should have been looked at earlier, I would think. As I understand your question, you were concerned about the heating system and... No, I, I was just trying to explain how bad the water is because of the furnace in my parents' house. We replaced two furnaces in 14 years. So, and the plumbers have said, this has been known for years that this water has been like it is, very destructive. What took so long to get to this point 
when it's been known for years that this water is this hard? Why are we just now getting into it? Well, a couple, couple things in response to your question. Uh, and I think we have to talk about uh, corrosivity. Uh, and, and I want to be careful with this, but I think all indications show that, that uh, Valley's water, Plainville's water, is, is, is not corrosive. At least that's uh, how we feel about it, and we believe that the testing will support that. As an example, you could start with pH. Uh, you could also take a look at our lead and copper results, which we uh, perform every three years. Uh, also, uh, whereas you may get blue blue green stain on plumbing fixtures and other utilities, I have very, in fact, I can't remember hearing a complaint about blue green stain. All indications that the that the water uh, is alkaline as opposed to being corrosive. Now, relative to boilers. Uh, what may be happening is uh, there may be some scale occurring within the, the, uh, the, the uh, heat exchanger. Uh, and and uh, that's, that's basically a consequence of hard water. Uh, I think it goes to, uh, you know, what are some of the preventive measures that we can do to, to minimize that? Uh, why have we uh, come to this point? How long uh, has it taken to at least address this. Uh, you, know, you know, we're aware that we've had hard water. Uh, we uh, uh, are sensitive to uh, customer complaints. Uh, we, we know there's hard water. Uh, we have kind of polled uh, our customers probably about a dozen years ago, and we had to do that um, because there's a capital cost associated with softening water supplies. Uh, and that's a very difficult uh, point to swallow, if you will, uh, in the eyes of many, many of our customers. As a matter of fact, there are many customers that are very happy with the water. There are no complaints. Uh, you know, there's a group, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, that it's not an issue. It is an aesthetic issue. But I just want to say that uh, sensitivities uh, vary from, you know, household to household, taste to taste. Uh, the, uh, the hard water situation, though, we acknowledge, uh, you know, impacts water supplies, uh, rather plumbing, fixtures, and, and heating, and we acknowledge that. Uh, does that answer your question? Probably not. Well, it doesn't Probably really, not. It doesn't really answer the question as why does it take so long to get to this point outside of cost. But it should have been brought Thank up you, a lot Jim. earlier, I would have thought. George, it really does come down, you know, to the balance of, of, of cost versus, you know, making the improvements. I think why is it being addressed now? Part of it is because of social media and that it, it make, that what it's just made it easier for people to express their concerns about the water system. The fact that we received a lot of complaints and a lot of concerns that were expressed led to, uh, you know, bringing the group together to say, hey, let's take a look at this once and for all and see if there's something that can be done. I'm not sure that we can look back as much because, you know, while we've, while, you know, I've been here 13 years and, and I've heard anecdotal concerns about the water and, you know, but, but I don't think there's been a real, uh, you know, drive or, or, or a lot of people getting together to, to express their, you know, their opinion all at one time, it really did come to a certain amount of crescendo, at least in my my opinion, you know, in November and December. And I, I think part of it was because of social media, and part of it was because we made it easier for, I thought we made it easier, or we encouraged people, hey, if you got an issue, let us know about it, so we can we can take a look at it. So uh, we're trying to look forward, but I, I think that's that's part of it. Is is, is it, there's a cost associated with this, and, and you know, we've been through rate you know, rate processes where, you know, people come in and say, hey, I'm paying too much for water. So, to, you know, as a water company, they can be sensitive to, hey, this is going to cost money, so should we really suggest something from our perspective, meaning the water company's perspective, uh, you know, to, to increase rates? And I think there's a nervousness about that. But if it's coming from the, from the customers, that's a little different, different perspective. Person in the blue, Scott. Woman in the blue. She had a question. Yeah, but she... Well, I don't have 
Okay. Um, I grew up in New Britain. I'm Colette Casey. I live in Hollyberry Lane. And we never had this problem, obviously. And I moved here 28 years ago. And I have complained year after year. I've talked to Valley Water several times. They've, told, they've given me the runaround, basically. And living here for 28 years, it's the same water. I buy my bottled water. I have a filter on the house. I can't even put the water in the filter water. I can't even put that into my iron because it still has that uh, white residence and it, it kills all the elements in my iron. So I have to buy bottled water just for my iron, just for my steamer. I've had plumbing problems where I had to replace the fixtures. And when I told Valley Water this, they told me I'm the only one that's been complaining. I've sat here right now and I've heard a lot of people complaining. So I know it's not just me. They've given me the runaround and they've told me that, well, Bristol has hard water. Well, Southington. But I said, I don't pay my money to Bristol or, or Southington. If they have problems, they can take care of it themselves. I pay my taxes here. I want my water fixed here. I don't care about anybody else's water. My water, I feel, is unsafe. And I feel like I put a lot of money into my water. I have a plumber here. That's my husband that also has done several things to the house to try to bring it up to par, and it's still not up to par. And it's very, very frustrating because I'm sitting here and I know nothing's gonna get done. And if something does get done, it's gonna come out of our pockets just like it's been coming out of my pocket for 28 years. So I'm very frustrated, and I know a lot of other people here, I'm, I'm very happy that they came here because now I can share my thoughts, how I felt for 28 years, how this water has been terrible and it has not been up to par. And I hope that if you do anything, that you listen to us tonight and you take this and try to change some of this, because we really do want this hardness to stop. We're fed up with it. We're tired of buying new appliances. We're tired of buying bottled water. We're just sick of it. And we want it to be stopped. And we hope that you will do something about it. I live over on um, Woodford Avenue on Hamlin Water's Edge. Um, so I'm in a condo. Um, so I know that you guys are saying that the two wells are being treated equally, just the same, although I've heard differently that one has a different filtering process, whereas mine doesn't. Um, but I know you're saying they're being treated the same. So I guess my question is, if they're being treated the same, what's causing the difference to my little area of the red map? Um, because clearly that's significant. And what do I do to reduce the hardest? I know you said it's going to be a six-month process and so on, but being in a condo, I can't put in a softener. It's literally not possible to do. Um, so I have, you know, filter on my shower head and things like that, but I don't even want to redo my bathroom um, because the fixtures are just going to get destroyed. So what do I do to just reduce the hardness in the meantime, and why... Why is there such a difference in my area compared to the other area of the town? Well, I think we all agree that the water is hard. We've, that's the main theme here, and that's what uh, we've uh, concluded through testing and everything else. But your question has to do why uh, is uh, your water hard uh, because you live at, near the Woodford Ave area? And the answer simply is that the water coming out of Woodford Ave is harder, you know, relatively speaking, than the Johnson Ave well field. Uh, and, and so you get somewhat harder water than, than that. Uh, what concerns me is that, uh, you know, uh, the responses that we allegedly, uh, you know, have uh, given to our customers, uh, and uh, we like to at least be a little bit more responsive and uh, be more attentive, be more accurate, I guess, in, in our reporting. I think that's coming up. But that doesn't address the hard 
hardness. Um, we're very concerned about our customer service and our response. And Nick has uh, shown you some of the things that we're going to be uh, taking into account. Uh, the hardness is uh, a, a situation that we all agree exists, but we have to say that we're going to evaluate uh, the options that we have, but they all come associated with a cost. And that's part of the capital cost that the DPU, uh, beg your pardon, Pura, um, uh, will look at. Uh, you know, they're going to say, okay, you're justified in doing this, but that is the reality of it. I, I can't express it any other way. There's, there's really nothing you can do. You, can, you say you can't install a softener. Uh, you may be able to install some sort of an inline filter. We could discuss that with you if you call us tomorrow or next week. Please do. Uh, we'll, we will listen to you and we will make recommendations. And if you don't uh, have the answers that you're satisfied with, I encourage you to call me personally. If you come up, if you come up forward, so everybody can hear you, that's all. Oh, oh. Sorry, Shane, I didn't really add this the microphone. Just, just one real quick thing, because I think there might be a little misunderstanding about what's going on. Neither the Woodford supply nor the Johnson Avenue supply are being treated for hardness at this time. The hardness is the naturally occurring characteristic of the water at those two sites. It just so happens that Woodford, the aquifer, and the natural calcium levels in the water at that site are higher than Johnson. Okay, so just to make sure that you understood that when we say we're treating the water at both places, neither site is being treated specifically for hardness. So is that something you guys are talking about? Exactly. Right, and, and it's, an, it's a naturally occurring process that th that's what it is, you know, when it comes out of the ground. So it just happens to be a natural thing that ours is working at. Exactly. You got it, yep. So then what do I do? Well, that's, <laughs> we're going to try to put on the website, like for your particular case, um, you know, there are products available to buy to put in the dishwasher or the clean this or that. That's what Nick was talking about. We'll try to get more of that information on the website now that we're hypersensitive to it. And um, hopefully in your case that would, that would be a help since you can't put in a whole house softener. Um, and uh, maybe we can all learn something in that process. Um, I'm Crystal Heft. I live in the Woodford area. Um, I'm just going to ask you guys to stop using the word aesthetic. Aesthetic is when there's a scratch on something. Aesthetic is when something doesn't look pleasing. We're not talking about just white film that we can just wash off and move on. We're talking about spending thousands and thousands of dollars on um, filtration systems or on damaged appliances on our furnaces. So every time we hear that word aesthetic, it feels a little bit insulting. So I don't know what word to use, but aesthetic isn't the right word. Scott right here. Um, I find it very confusing, all right? You've known for 30 years that there's been hard work, okay? And the water's been going along hard work, okay? And I, you all know all the effects it has. It ruins your appliances. Even filters cost you great deals of money, okay? There's water that you can't even drink out of your own faucet. And you know that because you know that's where the hard water is. And it's just baffling to me to stop and think that we've known it for 30 years, okay? Granted, 
we probably will, we're probably gonna have to go ahead and get this treatment center and we're gonna pay for it in the net, all right? My question is, weren't there things that you could have done along the way? I mean, smaller things, if they got filters for a home, couldn't you put some filtering systems uh, on the water that's flowing from the, from the pump systems? Could you add, if the filters weren't doing enough, could you add a line of filters to help out with that? It just seems so hard that you knew it's hard water. You know just exactly what it does. Okay? And this is only just a small handful of people in this entire town that are all suffering from this. And you know what? We talk, we, and I feel absolutely horrible for those people that have even harder water. Now, some of you are real lucky. You said we're lucky. All right? He got a little bit better water. But for most of us, we're not that lucky, are we? No. no. Okay? And I, I can't wrap my brain around the fact that with all of your intelligence and all of your background and all of your research and all of your testing, that over these 30 years, you couldn't do something? Just something that could help a bit. They don't make an industrial size, size filter to soften water a little bit? I mean, we, don't, we aren't asking you to give us beautiful spring water. Just something that I can drink out of the tap. Something that I can spray on my car and not take the next two hours wiping off all of the water spots. Okay? The fact that I do my dishes by hand because the dishwasher makes everything horrible. Every night I have to do the dishes by hand. Why? Because we have hard water. Okay? Is there a logical answer as to why in 30 years, you said back in 1984, in over 30 years, Okay. Now, other things that happen, all we have to worry about, we put fluoride in the water. Okay? We have pesticides, like he's talking about. We put special chemicals to take care of that. Okay? I just don't understand with something this large and having such a great effect in so many different ways, in health, in people that don't, can't put a filter in, in all those things that we don't, that we haven't done anything about the hard water. Thank you. Do we want to conclude on that uh, note? No, I have a question. Okay. I'm not trying to encourage it, I just. I got an easy question. Uh, you mentioned, Don, you mentioned lead and copper before. Do you add any cor corrosion control elements to the water? I watched the PBS thing on Flint. Uh, was the question, do we add any corrosion control to the water? Yes. Uh, we do not. Uh, it's a, it's a naturally occurring uh, uh, pH level, which uh, it runs somewhere in the vicinity of about 7, 2 to 7, 3, 7, 4. Uh, so there's no need to add anything that uh, uh, you know, uh, guards against corrosion because the water's not corrosive. Uh, the water's hard. Uh, it's it, this scaling that takes place, but it's not corrosive, so there's no uh, corrosive uh, in, in injection for anything like that. Okay. I'm, 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 that's a roundabout way to say no. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've had some discussion about whether, you know, the corrosive nature of the water, so I'd like the Department of Public Health and Lord yeah. to give so, a little perspective there. 
I like what you had to say. And I don't think I have a good answer for you, but I want to try to explain a little bit. Um, you know, gentleman's point back there, there's 90 contaminants, at least over 90 contaminants that are tested for that have very specific requirements. If you trigger a maximum contaminant level, you must do something. And we, that's our job is to enforce that. And for 40 years over the Safe Drinking Water Act since 1974, the, the federal government has been telling the states what to do. You shall do this, you shall do that. And they give, us, they give us a little bit of money, millions of dollars, as a matter of fact, to support my staff. And there's state money that comes in to support my staff. There's 45 of us there. And over the last 40 years, the federal government continuously changes the rules, constantly, telling us, here's what's important as far as health goes. And so the, I hear your frustration because I have the same, you know, I'm the chief of this group and I, you know, if something goes wrong 24 seven, I get the phone call, my staff get the phone call. We go out in the field, we, fi we work with the water utility to fix these things. But the focus has been on maximum contaminant level triggers. Now any one of the things on that sheet was triggered to say, well, if calcium had an MCL and it was triggered, we would have been working on it, but it doesn't. Uh, so what caused so the, the most frustrating some of the most frustrating part of my job is when I hear people can't drink the water And we work so hard at our state and I talked to dr. Pettit here and, you, and we're working on a state water plan and I just came from meetings in Apura in New Britain and my colleagues at New, in uh, Jack Bukowski and and Betsy Wingfield from Deep and uh, Dave Lavasser from OPM and the people within those four agencies, including myself and my commissioners, have worked really hard to make sure we can balance all the needs for water supply so that our water can, we'd have enough for the future. But it's so frustrating to hear people, because we not only, you're not the only utility that, I mean, we get phone calls and say, you know, I can't drink the water because it looks like it's brown today or yellow today. And it's very frustrating to me to, to hear but I'm trying to explain it a little bit is that we're driven a lot by the maximum contaminant levels. And the good news and what we're here to tell you today, they meet all the standards. We, we did a lot of sampling. We took a lot of information, summarized it all. But I think we're led by the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, not by people saying, wait a minute, you're, my dishwasher won't work, my coffee maker won't work, I can't, it won't soap up, I can't do this. That is not tripping a maximum contaminant level, and I think that's some of the explanation. But to me, to me, it's frustrating as well, because we work really hard in our state to have high quality sources of water and to make sure people can drink the water, because we don't want you spending money on bottled water. We want you spending your money um, on your water system so you can drink that water and feel that it's safe every day to pull from that tap for yourself, for your kids, for your infants, for women that are expecting children. You want to feel safe drinking that water. So it's a source of frustration as well. And that's why we did what we did. And we're going to stay and help. And that's, you know, as much as we can. And I hear your frustration, believe me. Um, as, as far as uh, Flint, Michigan, we're lucky here in the state of Connecticut because we are focused on uh, the lead and copper rule really has been a corrosion control treatment uh, very focused on treatment. So there is some treatment uh, in, in your water system for corrosion control. All the larger systems have it in the state of Connecticut, and we track and monitor lead and copper exceedances under that rule. Things are going to change in the future. The federal government's working on that due to Flint, Michigan. So y you're going to see changes that come about. But I, I, I share, and, and I'm responsible, my group here is responsible, for water quality, water quantity statewide. So I, I share your frustration when you say you cannot drink your water. That's frustrating to me. So we're here to help, we're here to work with the town, yourselves, and, and I hope maybe at some point in the future we could come back and we can hear from the water company, this is what we did, this is what we're studying, this is how we're gonna maybe blend water and change things for you. So that's what, that's what I'd like to see as, a, as an outcome, sir. So I, I don't know if I've helped or, or, or harmed you. So you're saying that you're being dictated to by government. Well, uh, I am the government, too. Level, <laughs> level, okay? All right. So that means that you really weren't able to do anything? Well, our focus, I think our, our area of focus has been uh -huh. 
the chemicals that do undo harm to people, uh, acute risk chemicals. Like if you found E. coli in your water, you're shutting down the water system. We are, we are issuing, they're issuing boil water notice. I mean, those are acute risk and we are after that all the time. You know, and the, so it's amount of risk, you know, and it's, it's the risk-based analysis and, and we go after the risk-based analysis. Um, so if, if, if calcium doesn't have the risk that an E. coli has, that, that's what we focus on. And, and the volatile organic compounds, the, the other ones that have MCLs. Oh, absolutely. That's why we're here. Thousands yeah. and thousands of dollars a year on, I agree. on dishwashers because of hard water and, and clothes that stink and bathrooms that have a horrible yes. smell because of yeah. hard water. And, right. and it goes on and on. But that's why we're here. I can't explain to you the last 30 years. Right. But I can explain to you now what we're trying to do. Okay. Fix my hard water. Mm -hmm. What are you going to tell me? One of the solutions, and many of the solutions that the uh, Tom, the engineers, they're going to be looking at, one of the slides is, is quite important to, to pay close attention to. I know when, when the town puts the slides up there, you can take a closer look at them, because they were hard for me to read. I couldn't see the slides. But the details of what the town, what, what, what Tom and the engineering firm that, that Valley's hi hired to do to pull that information together, to look at all the options and opportunities that are out there. There's options for mixing surface water from your surrounding neighbors. Now, your surrounding neighbors, as, as, as Robert mentioned, well, maybe they have, maybe they want to share water, maybe they don't, but that's a lot, there's a lot of negotiating around that. So bringing in some surface water may be able to help uh, uh, provide some relief to the hard water. But looking at that carefully is really very important because nothing is without a cost. And, and also, we spoke about the difference in the water quality between the two well fields. That is definitely the truth. And taking a closer look at that will help. Is there one well in particular in that particular well field that maybe you could reduce the take on that because that has the high, water, high hardness in it? But that's going to all be studied. And I think that's going to take a little bit of time. Why is that taking 30 years? I can't, expl I can't explain that to you. I can't explain. I have been around for 30 years, but I haven't been in charge for 30 years. But I, you know, I, like I've, I've mentioned to, to Robert, I said when, when he called me and let me know about what he's been hearing in the complaints and the concerns of the town council and what was happening here, that I said, you know, we're going to do what we can. We don't have limitless resources at the state, but we certainly can offer testing. We can come here and have my engineers involved. We provide oversight. Anything that's being proposed, by the water company for technical changes. My engineers, Tom will be the lead, Vicki will be involved, and Austin and Mike, those four engineers sitting right there that you've met and you can go and talk to, um, they will be involved with reviewing any of those technical changes. So I just, I hope I've helped with that, Robert, I don't know. The reality is in Connecticut and in, and in Plainville in particular that the Water, the private water systems that are run and even the public water systems that are run, are any, any of the operational costs, any of the capital costs of running those systems are going to be paid for by the customers. There's nobody else that's going to come in and, and supplement the cost of those systems. And so we have a, you know, a 6,800 uh, customer system that, uh, that, that is, you know, any, any changes to it are going to, are going to be paid for, by, paid for by the customers. Uh, that's why we have Pura, Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, because what they do is they go into the books of the water company and they make sure that they're not price gouging you. So that, you know, there's a balance there between, you know, the, the issue of, of what you pay for water against, you know, the, the improvements and, and the operational cost. So when you say, well, you're going to charge us for it, well, you know, there's nobody out there that's going to pay for it. And, and, and that's just the reality of, of the situation. And, uh, you know, at some point in time, hopefully over the next six months, eight months, you know, we will be back here in a forum such as this and, uh, and have a conversation about, well, this is what could be done. This is what the cost would be. So we, do you want to do it on a system-wide basis through the water company? Or do you want to do it on an individual basis? And there may be a lot of people in this community that come out and say, hey, uh, my water's fine. 
You know, and it, it, you know, you know, frankly, you know, and sir, you know, I, I understand your frustration. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we advertise this, this, this forum fairly extensively. Mm -hmm. And while I'm pleased and I'm happy that you came out and, and not only happy that you came out, but that you stayed the whole time and, and, and I hope you feel that we've put out some type of effort, I would have liked to have seen more people here tonight. You know, for, for, for a water system that's as terrible as, and I'm not debating whether you're right or wrong. I, I actually believe what you're saying. You know, I, I would have expected that we would have had 200 people here. And that's, that's somewhat disappointing. And, 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 and that's part of it. Some people are just complacent. And, and, you know, I can tell you that in the 13 years that I've been here as town manager, we haven't had one person come to the town council meeting and complain about the quality of the water. We've had people come to the rate hearing and talk about it, and we had a rate hearing you know, four or five years ago, and that was a handful of people. So um, I hear what you're saying, but you know, our most difficult, and I, and I say this fairly often, the most difficult part of our job as local town people, as a town manager, is trying to figure out what 51% of the people in this town want. And that's, that's not easy to do. But, as Laurie said, if we can't drink the water, and there's a significant amount of people that can't drink the water, we're going to get to the bottom of it, and we're going to make a decision as a community. And I hope that you'll be a little bit more patient. I, I think we've gone a, a, a longer distance than, it, than you know, over the last couple of months that have been done over the last 30 years. I believe that the water company is responding. I think they're changing. I think they're willing to change. And, and, and I hope that we do come up with something that will be cost effective and effective in terms of water quality. So I thank you for coming. I'm gonna ask Dr. Pettit to come up because he worked with, uh, with the group. He's your state representative as well. And, and give him a chance to make some concluding remarks. And then if anybody wants to stay afterwards and come down and talk to us individually, we will welcome to do that as well. I know the state people are getting a little anxious, you know, they're not used to coming out to you, but that, I know that they'll stay for a few minutes, few minutes longer as well. So, uh, Dr. Penn. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, I think Robert did a great job summing it up. Uh, my comments would be first in the form of uh, thanks. I've been up there for five months and uh, was on appropriations, and the folks from the Department of Public Health Water quality are an excellent group of people, and it was actually one of the few sections in the budget where a bunch of us in our caucus sat around and thought, don't go squeal to me to the governor or anybody. We thought they actually needed some more funding and some more people, that they're actually a little bit underfunded and don't have enough staff to take care of the water in the state, which is a big concern, especially given Flint and other areas around the country. So I think they've done a great job. I'd really like to thank Robert and the council, Mrs. Puglisi, Mrs. Tompkins, Mrs. Branty for putting this together, and the water company for being really so forthcoming and being responsive to this issue. Uh, to echo Robert's comments, I, I believe everything what people are saying, and, but one of the issues we had, this, this map is nice and it gives us a little bit of pattern. Scott will tell you because he put together the map, one of the perplexing things with one of the initial maps we put up is that we'd have a street my old my street, my old street, Broad Street. There'd be somebody at 140 that says, the water's terrible. Someone at 144 says, the water's great. Somebody at 160 says, well, it's okay. And somebody at 170 that, so there was no rhyme or reason. It looked like a shotgun blast. There was, some people thought it was great, some people thought it was okay, and some people thought it was terrible. So he said, geez, is it, is it mains? Is it pipes in people's own houses? What is the issue? Why does this look like? Why is there no pattern to what's going on? So this is one of the more helpful pieces of information we've come up with in terms of, in terms of mapping. So it was really confusing in the beginning because we got such disparate evaluations from the public about what they felt about their water and water quality. But I think this has been a great, a great process. Uh, I think it's been done very scientifically and very fairly. And I think we are gonna see uh, an improvement. So I think, I hope you'll give the town, the state, the water company a little bit of time, but I think we're going to see an improvement and come forward with some suggestions as to how uh, we can deal with the, the hardness and, and the water that's affecting people's quality of life and people's appliances and the like. But I, I really thank you for, for coming out. You're, you're the participators, the people that are going to 
help make a change because two or three have showed up, there probably would have been no change. The fact that there's 40 or 50 people out here, I think we're going to have a change. That's sort of a groundswell. So really thank you very much and I thank everybody for coming. And I guess the one final comment, and Robert made it as well, Piro's got your back in terms, in terms of the rates. Uh, if we have to put money into the system, it's, you know, I'm on, I'm on Redstone Hill, so I'm, I'm sort of in that orange, orange area there, you know, on the Bristol border. Um, a lot of people think we're on Wells, but we're, we're, on, we're on Valley Water. Um, so we're sort of in the middle of the road in terms of, in terms of hardness. And it, so it may, cost, it may cost a few bucks, but I think it probably is going to be well worth it in terms of uh, quality of life. So really thank everybody for participating. And I think, as Robert said, everybody's going to stick around and answer a few questions if need be. So thanks very much, everybody. Uh, we did tape this tonight on, on Nutmeg Network, uh, and we thank them for coming out. We will, we will try to advertise when this will be on TV, so if you're, your neighbors or your friends that uh, at least want to uh, watch the program, uh, you know, that'll be available as well. We'll probably post, post a link to it as well. So. All right, thank you again.